We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And welcome back, Tom. However, if you are watching us on the YouTube version, welcome back logo on the left-hand side of the screen. That's right. Because uh, as you might imagine, Tom's theater is still uh, not put back together. So he's like, forget the video. all in the center hands. of the room. <laughs> like everything is in the center of the room covered in plastic. Right. And it will be probably months yeah. before I get it back. I hear you. So... Yes. Uh, as far as, so those of you, thank you for all the concerns and stuff and uh, the, the notes of support. Yes. I appreciate it. Again, I did not suffer nearly as much as many of the people in my neighborhood. Uh, but still. I just was talking to a person whose, the water was six inches from the bottom of their granite countertops. Holy <laughs> smokes. <laughs> that is a... That's that. Yeah, let's get half ton of water. Three feet ish. Okay. <laughs> Holy cow! That's yeah. That's horrific. That's a that's a bit of water. No and, kidding. Uh, so you know, it is what it is. I am like I said. I'm not. We're not suffering. We're inconvenienced at best. Sure, but right now it is we spent the weekend going through the garage and doing an mm. itemized list of everything that yeah. got destroyed in there, which is more than you think. That's always I a mean, fun task, isn't it? It's 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 what it is. <laughs> I am. Not complaining. So things are, things are. You know, right now we're kind of in the holding pattern, waiting for uh, us to get quotes for okay. repairs that we send off to the insurance company, which they'll surely reject and give us a <laughs> fraction of the money for because insurance. And then they'll raise our rates. Oh yeah, because that's the way these things work. Oh yeah, but, uh, they're they're not really in the business of handing out money. They're in the business of weird. collecting it ahead of time and then giving back as little of it as they little can possibly possible. get away with. That's yeah. Right. Uh, but right. before we go any further, to make sure we don't forget, I want to thank Joe Klusnik for yes. guest co-hosting last week. Uh, that was very nice, and it was uh, a, a nice, appropriate uh, time uh, fit very well because he had just returned from Cedia, so was able to give you know firsthand experiences of stuff that uh, neither Tom nor I saw in person. So uh, yeah, that worked out very well. And thank you to Joe. Uh, that episode, of course, last week, also known as the betrayal of Lee Overstreet, because uh, many people did uh, catch on to when I said I I didn't even reach out to Lee to ask him first because I I reached out to Who? Joe first. And uh, and there you go. Yeah, we we might. We might just never hear from Lee again. We stabbed him in the heart, stabbed him in the back. Any complaints you want to send about that, send them to <laughs> Lee at avrant. Lee at avrant.com. That's exactly what it's there for, yes. Don't worry. That's what it's there for. <laughs> but thank you, Joe. <laughs> yes, if I sound a little echoey, I am in my kitchen. There's sure. no room treatments in here. It is very, it's tile everywhere, and it is... You're still like for all going. the people who've done their their uh, Zoom meetings and everything for the past couple of years. They're like you still sound way better than <laughs> like everybody else's incredibly crappy microphone. So your your audio technica there is doing its job. My wife is like, oh, can we just set up the home theater real quick? Mm. You know, and we'll just you know so that we can watch some stuff. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Hey, absolutely you not. Know, maybe you'll buy it's a little it. TV to put somewhere at this point. Yeah. I'm, not interested in, no. in setting up that home theater <laughs> at all. I mean, first of all, they cut off the bottom of the drywall where, so like the, the way that the silver ticket screens work is yeah. kind of keyhole mounts, yeah. top and bottom, and you slide them into place. Well, the, the bottom one, the bottom screw that you keyhole mounted into got removed because okay. it was part of the drywall that got right. removed. And so I can't do it even if I wanted to. And second, I don't want to. I did paint behind there because yeah. I couldn't get the... Remember we talked yeah, about I that? Yeah, I mentioned that uh, last week to, to let everyone yeah, know. Yeah, like, you're uh, actually going to take the opportunity to uh, yeah, complete I was very excited about that. Room. I mean, you know what you should do? You should get on board for one of those tele TVs, the completely free TV, as long as you watch the, the ads on the second screen that they like staple to the bottom of that thing that never turns off and constantly show you, you ads. But but it's a free 55 inch television. That's what Tom should do. Say yeah, it's for the podcast. I'm not doing that. Either. <laughs> yeah. So we have, uh, yeah, I could have actually done the podcast last week, but there was like 10, maybe not 10, maybe there's five different people that were supposed to right. show up at this house that day around that time <laughs> one showed up a little like a, right around the time that we record mm -hmm. but he was here for five minutes and left and then okay. everybody else canceled oh i see well i mean there was no reason to put yourself out whatsoever and uh, and it all worked out swimmingly so but yes. we are glad to have you back even if it's without yes. video 
<laughs> yes, it will be without video for a while because okay. I'm not cleaning up my kitchen. I mean, hey, I went YouTube. through that for a spell there, didn't I? So yes, everybody is going to be used to it. <laughs> All right. What did you watch, Rob? Yeah. So uh, continuing on with Star Wars Rebels, I finished up season three now. So I just have one final season to go, which is 15 episodes, a little bit shorter than seasons two and three. So yeah, uh, you know what? Honestly, quite enjoying this. It gets a little bit darker and darker and darker as each uh, season progresses. So while the I first... just finished the episode that where they co- copied uh, Pitch Black. Okay. <laughs> Yes. The one the one with the monsters so that, there you go. that can't come out in the sunlight. So Spoiler I'm in alert, one, Tom so. Tom is uh, uh, now watching Star Wars Rebels in season one. So yeah, well, while there things uh, seem a little bit more lighthearted there. Uh, but what I, I have noticed uh, now having completed season three of Rebels is um, they, they are, I guess, taking it as an opportunity, but also running into the fact that this is all taking place within like established timelines from the movies. So right. this uh, Rebels is all taking place prior to episode four and New Hope. So yes. they're now running into, okay, now we've already established where like some people are and there's people in this show that you've never heard of in the movies and we kind of need to find an explanation for why you've never heard of these yes. people in the movies. And there's all the stuff that we established back in the Clone Wars animated series. And then there's the stuff that happens after Return of the Jedi in The Mandalorian and in Ahsoka. So it's like all this stuff needs to fit. <laughs> And it's like you're I'm kind of seeing just some be of the more like the comic books and just be like eh, some whatever. some of the contortionism <laughs> writing is is in there Retcon. it's like okay yeah yeah that's I, but but it is uh, perhaps somewhat limiting what can happen to some of these so, characters I don't did you talk about this last week because the first week we talked about Ahsoka and yes. I, I watched the first Maybe two episodes of Ahsoka, and okay. then I stopped, and I started watching. Okay, this that's where I am. Too. I don't want to see, I don't want to see any more Ahsoka until I yeah. can see it on a big screen. Okay, so I don't want to see any more. It's going to be a while. Know, it's going to be a hot minute. Uh, but you had complained that you didn't know what to watch, you know, which episodes to watch or whatever. Uh, oh, just in like order if to you be caught up with Ahsoka. Yeah, if you didn't so want to watch, watch all of Rebels, if you didn't have the time to watch yeah. all of it, then you could pick and choose because, yeah, I mean, you've probably already seen a couple episodes where you're like, well, yeah, I didn't need to have seen that yes. for things to make well, sense. Well, I don't know that if it's happening in Canadian Disney Plus, but okay. there was definitely like a playlist on Disney Plus for yes. a while that was like these are the episodes and it had Clone Wars stuff and That's it had right. and had a couple Rebel rebels. stuff and, but and the thing Mandalorian was, those, stuff those and were else. only Ahsoka Tano episodes ah. and now in the Ahsoka series there's actually probably more time spent with the Rebels crew than there is with Ahsoka herself so it's like yeah those were the episodes of Rebels that Ahsoka Tano appeared in but you're not gonna get all of the Rebels characters backgrounds if you only watch those episodes so yeah i wouldn't say right. that that is completely sufficient just going with that little curated list that they came up with although if you just mm. want to see ahsoka and nobody else then yeah that would work so okay that was that right. uh so yeah other than that uh watched the movie i watched elemental which came out on disney yeah, plus disney plus uh, yes. was in theaters not that long ago so they brought it over there pretty darn quickly honestly i, I really liked this movie um this is another one this is a pixar uh disney pixar uh but this is another one where we don't have a classical Disney villain whatsoever. Yes. It's about intergenerational uh, family issues, and it's an immigrant story. Um, but what I really loved about this was the creativity of how it's like, the, these are anthropomorphized versions yes. of fire, water, air, and uh, not so much earth, but more like plant life. Um, right. And just the the creativity they had of like, okay, if, if these creatures existed, they would use their abilities in ways that just seem completely normal to them, but are novel to us. And I thought they did a really good job of like, okay. how, how do you just solve day-to-day problems when you are made out of fire? And it was like, <laughs> I really like that stuff. Uh, I, I thought that was really good. I mean, beautiful, colorful. Um, the, the characters, when you see them, for me anyway, when you see them at first blush, and I've seen some other comments uh, to this effect, I, I wouldn't say they're immediately aesthetically pleasing, the characters themselves. Mm. But once you get into it and get used to it a little bit, then I really, I really like them by the end. So uh, mm. I, I came around on all the characters. This, this was one where. Uh, I mean, the characters really had arcs, and when you first meet them, you don't necessarily like them. Like they're they're kind of they're not everybody's super likable right at the beginning. So this is a movie that, if you only go by the first 
10 minutes, <laughs> you might be like, I don't necessarily love the way the characters look. I don't necessarily love the way the characters act. And you, I could see some people being turned off if you stop immediately. I would urge you not to do so. Everybody goes on a journey. I really loved everybody by the end. I loved the way everybody looked by the end. And so it was well worth a watch. I wouldn't put it quite as high as Encanto. I, I thought that movie was like an absolute masterpiece. I wouldn't quite put this up there, but Elemental, well worth a watch. And I could see why it had legs in the theater, that word of mouth spread. And uh, yeah. and people did end up going, even though it didn't have the biggest opening weekend. I have... Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Uh, I saw that it was on Disney+. Plus. Again, I'm kind of on the fence about certain watching certain certain things uh, on the computer. I which wouldn't is what I'm limit doing. yourself completely to that, though. It's Yeah. yeah. I know, but I'm like... Eh. I kind of want to hear it nice. And nice I know. <laughs> okay, I, I do want to talk about Pixar in general. I want to talk about one of the things that you said, uh, which is that there was no traditional villain. Mm -hmm. I uh, I feel like we need to do away completely with the traditional villain. Okay. Uh, and, and they here's must my agree with you. <laughs> that they do, but here's my explanation why. It we have an entire generation, and it's my generation, mm -hmm. and everybody before me, basically. But my generation, and maybe the millennials. Uh, somewhat as well uh, have this have been and I'm going to say the word indoctrinated but maybe just uh, kind of uh, just gotten used to this idea that cut off the head and the body will die I see sure it, it's the entire like Darth Vader throws the the emperor off mm -hmm. into the thing and then the empire falls sure you know which is you know, it, that's never how anything works in real life. You know, <laughs> well, that, in a way, that's why the stories were so nice, because they were simple. They were very simple, yes. black and yes. white, and they have very clear beginnings and ends, and you can go on with your happy life afterwards. <laughs> that's right. And it's like, it, it, in real life, like, right. even if there's like one person who's like actively being evil, <laughs> and they come after you, and then you defeat them or kill them or get rid of them, send them to prison or whatever. Mm -hmm. They usually have a friend or a family member who's still going to come after you. Yes. You know, that's historically the way things work. So I like the idea that we are getting away from this traditional okay. villain thing. Cause I just, I just, I, I, I feel like it, 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 it encourages simplistic thinking towards well, yeah. complex problems. Okay. And I while see. it's good for storytelling, it's bad for like later on in life when people are like, well, if we just like if we just get rid of this person, then all of our government problems will be fixed. <laughs> well, which yeah, is yeah. what people say right now. They're like, just you know, no matter who, which presidential person you love mm -hmm. or or hate, if you if you just got rid of the one you hate, everything would still be effed up. Okay, <laughs> well, there would in be the no world, difference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I like the, the idea that we're moving away from traditional hmm. villains. The one, and so I do. I really appreciate that Pixar has most of their movies have just gotten away from all that, Quite which a bit, I, yes. I really, I really like. What I, what I think Pixar, I'm seeing from Pixar that's bothering me, is stagnation as far as their animation style. Hmm. They have gotten, they have really solidified this whole you know, look that really doesn't look that much different from The Incredibles. Like since the, in, in my mind, that was sort of like The Incredibles in, in that era. Really, we don't see, it doesn't look that much different to me than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to see them evolve uh, in an art style away from. I mean, I will say there is uh, definitely stuff in Elemental that is that it definitely advanced since the time of mm -hmm. The Incredibles. So. Well, I'm not saying it hasn't advanced, but yeah. I'm saying it's not different. You know, you, okay. so you if you look at Toy Story and then you go through the different iterations of what they've done, like every movie, like you see Monsters, Inc., right? Mm -hmm. Monsters, Inc., they, it's like, we learned how to do hair and we're going to do a bunch of it. Yep. <laughs> you know? and, then, and then like, the, you know, we learned how to do this and we're going to do a bunch <laughs> of it and that sort of thing. And we're not seeing that. So I would like to see uh, some sort of... Uh, visual improvement or visual change in their style okay. in forthcoming movies. But that's just my personal thing. But go ahead. What else have you watched? Uh, so I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, that Barbie came out on, uh, at least on Apple Movies. It came out on the digital version. The disc release hasn't happened yet. But just to comment, I did watch it right away, purchased it and watched it right away. And this is a movie that uh, I ended up seeing it twice in theaters and now I've seen it at home. And this is one of those movies where Greta Gerwig, the way that she shot this movie working with her cinematographer, it's like, you want to see this movie as big and filling as much of your field of view as you possibly can. Um, mm. it, th there's definitely details that I 
I saw now that I can see it in 4K resolution HDR on my television. Uh, there, there's stuff that I picked up, and plus having seen it twice before, now I'm, I'm paying more attention to the background and stuff like that. But um, yeah, this is absolutely a movie that that uh, it was meant to be seen as large as you possibly can. That's the way it was shot. That's, in my opinion, the best way experience. I was thinking back to like, uh, I know where, you know, there's problems in the real world with uh, with Brian Singer, but the way that he shot, like, for example, X2, uh, X-Men United, yes. that was a movie where it's like, yeah, the experience in the theater was, it was noticeably different from watching it on a television at home and it felt better in that very large format so i would say the same is true of barbie and that was just a comment that that came to mind and the last thing i want to quickly mention not something i watched but something i've been listening to is uh strike force five the podcast that has brought together uh stephen colbert jimmy kimmel jimmy fallon john oliver and uh who am i forgetting out of this group uh the the other uh fifth (laughs) talk shows oh Oh, seth uh seth myers um oh seth myers yeah, so they are doing the podcast and it's being sponsored basically by Ryan Reynolds's various companies um, and all, all the money that they're getting from the advertising that basically Ryan Reynolds is paying for is they're, they're giving to their staff while everybody is on strike. Uh, they're writing stuff. So basically Ryan, Re- Ryan Reynolds is floating their industry. <laughs> floating five <That> man, <laughs> late night talk shows, yes, more or less. That, that man's like, <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to just rely on these rugged good looks and, sport, <laughs> and this, you know, this hilarious personality that I have forever. I'm also going to invest in just random oh, stuff that seems like a good idea for me. He's an incredible then, businessman. <laughs> oh, my God. The whiskey. I think he did the whiskey for a while. Well, he did the vodka, the vodka for sure. Or, gin, yeah. or, or the gin. Rather, yeah. Aviation gin. Yeah. Yep. And then, no, then, the, then the Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile, and yep. the, the soccer team. Wrexham, oh, yep. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so, the good, so they just, they are very thankful to uh, to him and his companies. And, and he does. He records his own advertising spot for every episode. So you get some Ryan Reynolds does. in there, too. Uh, but just honestly... Um, it, of course, you've got these five very big personalities who are used to being dominating the conversation, right? They're, every one of them does a monologue on their shows. Uh, like John Oliver, for example, is just talking at you for 35 minutes straight uh, when he does his show. So it was really interesting to me to see them sort out through the first five episodes. I think they've done six or seven at this point, but I've only heard five. Um you know, sort of, sort out. I, I almost like the the natural pecking order. Like who's who's kind of gonna take the lead? Who's gonna step back a little bit? And it was kind of fun to hear them working that out in real time while they're doing this podcast. And I mean, it. Be, what what surprised me was. Stephen Colbert has always been like extremely well spoken. Uh, you know, really excellent diction um, at all. That, but he. In real, I mean, this isn't really real life because it's still a show, but a, a little bit closer to real life because it's not pre-written. He's yeah. kind of intimidating, which I didn't expect. Um, Stephen Colbert. Colbert, yeah, really, yeah. Um, and I like I don't, not in a way that I think he's intending to be, but um, if anybody is the alpha out of that group, it's Stephen Colbert, quite quite obviously. And it, if anyone were his general, it would be Jimmy Kimmel. That's pretty obvious. He he definitely gets mm. in there with the the one liners more than anyone else. But like Seth Meyers, I practically forgot he's on the show because he just, he is just he's in the background. <laughs> he's like way behind the other mm. four. And then <laughs> episode five was definitely the funniest one they did. And it's basically because they figured out if everyone just piles on and rags on Jimmy Fallon, this works. And so the poor guy has absolutely become the punching bag of the group. Jesus. It's like, it's kind of, it's really entertaining to hear how this pecking order came out. But I was honestly surprised at, at Stephen Colbert. I was like, yeah, I, I didn't realize that he's got like really quite an overbearing personality, uh, but it's still very entertaining to listen to. So there we go. Interesting. Yeah, Strike right. Force Five. If you want to check. Well, it out. I think we should support the podcast simply because they they're supporting their writers and that's right. and their staff uh, who are. Yeah, they're, they're not asking for donations or anything like that. They're just, just you listen to the podcast and hear the ads by Ryan Reynolds, and there you go. <laughs> and it, honestly, like Ryan Reynolds ads, like why can't all the ads be like you can see like the the the. the you know the ad companies trying to make ads mm-hmm. that, that that keep you engaged, and every single one of them, you're like, "Oh God!" Yes. And then you scroll right yeah. because it's terrible. But Ryan Reynolds, he's like, every ad he does, I'm like, "Well, I mean, it's going to be funny. I know mm-hmm. that." So there's going to be that, but also, it's never it never feels forced. It just feels to me like he's 
you know, like I'm going to do a bit. And yep. would you like oh, to hear he does this a bit? bit? And the answer is, <laughs> yeah, I would like to. I would like to hear this bit. Well, and also on the podcast itself, Stephen Colbert introduced Jimmy Kimmel to the AI voices that you can create in like five minutes online, which somehow Jimmy Kimmel had missed in all of this. And he's just like, oh, oh, I'm going to do some stuff with this. <laughs> So yeah, go support that podcast. I, I rarely say that about other podcasts because I normally don't care, but I think this is yeah, it's good. worth a listen. Yeah. Uh, so I have obviously not been watching anything. I have been watching uh, Star Wars Rebels uh, a little bit. My wife and I are watching because uh, again, we're just watching on my laptop, which is very small, and uh, and we're watching like old pole vaulting and track and field. My, okay. my kids, my my sons have all pole vaulted. Yeah. And uh, so we're watching old pole vaulting and and. Uh, older i think that right now we're watching like the, the world games or whatever i don't know what it's called uh 2022 the women's pole vaulting whatever i think my son who's a pole vaulter of course said it came in he goes what are you watching it and then whatever whatever we're watching he goes oh they're gonna break the record i'm like you're a jerk get out yeah <laughs> like why are you here like, why did we give birth to you like why do i keep <laughs> feeding you because you're obviously a terrible person um I've also uh, been keeping up with the La Volta, which is the the Spanish Tour de France, mm -hmm. right? Which is, uh, if you're into cycling, which most of you aren't because cyclists are weird. <laughs> uh, honestly, dude, I am a cyclist. I am weird. I hang out with cyclists and I'm with them. I'm going, man, I thought that was weird. You guys are freaking weird. <laughs> like all of you are weird. I got off air, Rob, remind me to tell you about the guy whose favorite color is green. Okay. Like, he is, I mean, he's a nice enough guy, but he is very strange. All right. So, um, anyways, the Volta, if you don't know, you don't have to know anything about cycling. You've probably heard about it uh, if you've been watching the news in the United States. Uh, an American won it for the first time in forever. Like, I think 10 years was the last time we ago uh, we, we won a major, uh, an American won a major uh, tour mm -hmm. uh, race like this, which is there's the Giro d'Italia, the Tour de France, and the, the the Volta, and those are like the three big ones, which are like the 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 Tour de France is of course of France, and then there's the Italian one and then the Spanish one, and there's other races that are out there that are also very big that Americans have won. But Sepp Kuss is the American winner who won it. First of all, to be a good cyclist, mm -hmm. you have to have a stupid name. It's like. <laughs> And no, no shade at Sepp Kuss. It's not his fault. It's just what it is, right? It's not coincidence. But like, it's destiny. Hearing these guys talk about it, and you see the like when you when you then the guys and gals who are doing the the announcing, you hear them talk, you know, talking about these people, and then you look at the spellings of their names, and you're like, that's not even close. I see. Like uh, Jonas Vindigo. I mean, he's got two A's back to back in his name, uh -huh. and then and it ends with a, a, a R D, and it's Vindigo. That's how you say his name. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not my fault. It's just the way it is. But boy, the American, like the NPR lady that was uh, was interviewing Sepp mm -hmm. Kuss, first of all said his name wrong, and then said everybody else's names wrong too, okay. which was hilarious. But like the biggest names in the uh, the business, Walt Van Art, which is he's on the same team as Sepp Kuss. You know, it's Vindigo, Remco, Avon the Bull or something like that. I mean, they are just, I mean, it, I couldn't make these names up if I tried. So you have to have a stupid name to be like a really good cyclist. But Sepkus is what they call a domestique, which is a, the guy, that the, the pe person that helps the other person on the team win. Okay, gotcha. So there's a, there's a couple of different, there's like, like, a, like a lot of different people. Like a team could be like seven or in a single race, like up to seven people, I yeah. think, depending on the, which race it is. And only one or maybe two of those are really geared towards winning the race for yeah, the, the rest team. of the team helps you draft, the helps you organize yeah yeah and sep kusa what they call a super domestique because he's like very very strong almost strong enough to win the race right. by himself but it really quite kind of isn't but because of the way that these things work out uh he ended up getting to the front of the race at the exact right moment where the only way that any anyone else on his team who or they had uh, Jonas Vindigo and uh, and uh, oh, uh, 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 Primus Roglic, which is again, <laughs> I, I have no I idea mean, what any of this is. <laughs> that these two guys are like two of the superstars of, of cycling. The only way that that they could get to the front of the race and become the the leader, like Sepp Kuss was, was to beat him. Okay, but they are all on the same team, right? So they couldn't do it without looking like big fat jerks. Uh, okay, and 
it, especially Primos, was like super not happy about okay. it from what we could tell by the interviews. It's been so much drama, <laughs> and Sepp is like this super nice guy. Like you could, you, you they would like he get across the finish line at one of the stages, and they'd have microphones and stuff there, and Sepp would be apologizing mm-hmm. to his own guys. Oh, sorry guys, I didn't mean to win. You know what I mean? It's, just like this, it's been like three weeks of drama, and it's hilarious. But uh, American finally won uh, a major tour. And I'm thrilled about it. And it's and he's a super nice guy. And he's from Durango, Colorado, which I have been to on a giant family vacation one time. And it's super full of hills, so it makes sense that he's a strong climber. But gotcha. man, if you if you have never watched cycling before, yeah. cycling is boring. Don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I watch it is because you can talk through the whole thing. All right, you'll never miss anything. And if there anything important happens, they'll show it to they you. They will definitely times. highlight it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it'll be fine. All right, let's talk about our listeners of the week. Yeah. First of all, let's talk about the podcast. Mm. This is the AV Rant Podcast, where we answer your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us a question at avrant.com. I'm very echoey, echoey, echoey. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good avrant. time. avrant.com. Uh, go to our website, and uh, you can find our old show notes and uh, and our. I mean, I was gone for one week, so now I can't remember what to say. Flickr albums. Our show notes and our Flickr albums where you can follow along with uh, every, all of the things that we're talking links about. Links to any products we talk about. That's right. Right. And there are non-affiliated links, too. That's so right. You know, it's just for your convenience to find what we talked about because you sometimes... I should, we should, I should make you start using affiliate links. Nope. Well, I'm not doing do. any more work than I'm already doing. <laughs> The you affiliate can do links it are. If you want. Yeah, there you go. I should go back and do there's it. No, I should do. There's no technical reason you can go back to right. put affiliate links where the links already exist. That's right. All right. Uh, <laughs> then I have to set up an affiliate program. And That's right. Thing. I know. Too much work. I'm very busy, Rob. I'm a very very busy person. <laughs> you can find us at uh, facebook.com slash avrant podcast, youtube.com slash avrant, where you can see our live recorded sessions usually with both videos but not right now for me mm-hmm. contact rob directly rob at avrant.com his other social media is at first reflect i'm tom at avrant.com and i'm not on any of the other stuff i'm <laughs> there but i'm just not paying attention to it so don't mm-hmm. all right let's talk about our listeners of the week become a listener of the week you support the podcast in some way one of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com click on the buy us a cup of coffee link and sending us a PayPal donation. So this week, we want to thank Ty, who clicked on the checkbox to make an automatic monthly donation from PayPal. So yeah, that is an much, option Ty. via PayPal now. So thank you, Ty, for doing that. He doesn't have to remember to manually make a donation every month. It's just going to automatically happen now until his thank credit card you, expires. <laughs> Thanks, Ty. Right. Which, or like mine, somehow I got some weird freaking charge. Like it was crazy mm-hmm. for a, like a marketing company. I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't think so. Fun. And then they... They canceled my card without yeah. telling me, and then nothing worked for a while. So now Perfect. Disney Plus and everybody's like, "Why aren't you? Why can't mm. we charge you for more money?" I'm like, "I'm not using you anyway. Shut up." Uh, if you if you want to make a monthly donation, and you don't want to go through PayPal. Mm-hmm. You can go through patreoncom slash podcast where we have 133 three patrons right now, including Bertrand. Thank you very much, Bertrand. That is right. Yeah, patreon.com slash podcast. Just like Tom said, if you want to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation that way, so big thanks to our 133 patrons. Bertrand, thank you for being one of them. All right. uh, uh, We've got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going through... Everything. Thin. Yes. All the stuff. I don't know. I I guess I haven't been paying attention to what's been going on this week. I I don't know. They... they, (laughs) They started we, every, like in. I know that the news news have been out here, like mm-hmm. recording stuff, because I see them. But every single person in this town I've met that I've talked to, they're like, "I had no idea how bad it was out here." Ah, like, right. You have no idea. It is like a third world. Like right, the last mm. n- the last uh, numbers I heard was forty forty six percent of the houses in my neighborhood got water in them. Okay, which is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got some gratitude from Ty, who says he's been binging through our past episodes while he drives, and he appreciates our pragmatic, non-gatekeeping approach. Also, Yay. he sends his best to me and my family as I as uh, we recover from the flooding. Thank you very much, Ty. Daz hopes everything is improving and is on the upswing. Well, it's on the end in the it's it's improving. It improved in and progress. Stopped. Yes. <laughs> All right, Jared James, who thanks us for our commitment to the podcast, come hell or high water, literally. <laughs> he was also very sorry to hear about my flood. 
hoping for all the best and remains a dedicated to our plus club member and Rohan. So thank you to all of you for thanking us. Yes, I'll say the names Ty, Daz, Jared, James, and Rohan. Thank you all very much. I will also say there were probably stuff like YouTube comments and, and yeah. X posts and stuff that you know, I, I didn't I didn't gather everything, <laughs> only the stuff that came via email. But thank you to everybody who uh, sends us notes of gratitude and encouragement and well wishes to Tom. Uh, it's all yeah. very much appreciated. And thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. My favorite th- thing I learned about X uh, this week was that they um I, i'm not calling it that the fa- favorite thing i learned about twitter this week is that they are now being sued by the federal government because when you say you want to delete something there's no way that it automatically deletes mm-hmm. it it just it kind of has to wait for a human to do it which of course never <laughs> happens especially since he fired everybody yeah, there's so. three people left working there now so all you people who uh who like me who deleted all your your <laughs> stuff when and got off of that when it was when it started to be taken over by racists i just just know it's all still there it's all still there it's pretty awful have access to it pretty pretty awful yeah so i haven't opened it in a while and i don't (laughs) plan to all right in the news ps5 consoles got a pretty uh, substantial system software update last week PS5. It added some accessibility features for the DualSense controller, support for a larger 8 terabit uh, solid state drives. Uh, sorry, add-on, sorry. And the major thing for us in home theater fan and home theater fans is uh, Dolby Atmos support. Game publishers can now update or release games that negatively support Dolby Atmos audio, but they don't necessarily have to. Sony's Tempest 3D audio has been there since the beginning, and you could hear it through the headphones or stereo speakers. Now the PS5 can put that Tempest 3D audio into a Dolby Atmos container to be decoded by soundbars and AV rec- How could this possibly go wrong? Mm-hmm. I feel like this is the perfect solution. There will never be a time when a sound nope. that was supposed to be beside you comes from behind you or vice versa or something weird like that. No. Some no, overhead that's, just, that's this will in front be perfect. of you. This will be a seamless transition from that's right. their DSP controlled crap to, Atmo- to Atmos, which was definitely done by a human with years all right this is the same the same is true for all streaming media apps one of our listeners mark let us know that first nothing has changed for movie disc playback you could always set the disc player to output bitstream audio including lossless atmos and dtsx and that's still the case but second if you set your ps5 to out, output atmos and everything comes out in the atmos container all of the time yes oh thank god mm-hmm. i would hate for it to be any better than or Microsoft, than the Microsoft counterpart, <laughs> it would be terrible if somehow the PS5 was less terrible than the Xbox That's Series right. S. But here we go. So if you're streaming a movie with just a 5.1 soundtrack or you're playing a YouTube video with two-channel audio, your AV receiver still says it's getting at most. That's right. So FYI on that one. Yep. Then it announced their 68, X6800H receiver model for $3,500, although it won't be available until early 2024, much like the 6700H that it will replace. It has 11 amplifiers built in. I think they're having a hard time getting more amplifiers into these things. 140 <laughs> watts per channel, two channels driven, but it can process up to 13 speakers. And, of course, it gets four instead of two subwoofer outputs, so you can go up to 7.4.6 or 9.4.4 configurations. You get seven full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 inputs and three outputs. There are still some analog video inputs, although just two composite and one component with no analog video inputs at all. Outputs at all. Yeah. Outputs it's got at the all. inputs, Sorry. but outputs. no outputs. It's got the inputs out. Okay. So this is strictly about converting old video sources to HDMI. It still comes with Odyssey Multi-Q XT32 with the option to pay extra for... Uh, Multi QX, which is the program, two hundred bucks or something like that, and or Drac, so you can get Drac with that. That's right. So yeah, the back panel changed a fair bit from the layout on the X sixty seven hundred H. So that is changed. Uh, this has the ability to do Drac, uh, which uh, you could do Multi QX back on the sixty seven hundred H, but you couldn't do Drac on that one. Uh, the four subwoofer outputs, and uh, then yeah, uh, the X sixty seven hundred H was one of those models that had a single HDMI two point one input, no HDMI two point one switching on the sixty seven hundred. So that has been remedied now. Now you've got uh, seven HDMI two point one inputs to switch between on the sixty eight hundred H. But other than that, uh, no big change. I was kind of hoping for a model that, like, honestly, if it had 11 amps built in but could process 15 and required four channels of external, I was like, ah, I was kind of hoping for that. I mean, that would have to be, at this point, a 7800H in the model lineup because there's a jump and a big, big price delta between the 6800H at 11 built in and processing 13 up to the 
15 built-in and 15 processing A1H flagship. There's a $3,000 difference between those two models. So something could shimmy its way in there price-wise that could process 15 without necessarily having 15 amplifiers built in. But no such model exists, so you got to pick your poison. Mm. Yeah. Very exciting. I don't really see why we need more speakers. <laughs> honest with you. All right. Harmony remote users continue to be on the lookout for a true replacement option. And that's CDA 2023, the a AVA or AVA. I mean, it's capitalized AVA. I don't know how they want it pronounced. It's at least an acronym that you could pronounce. So I'm going to say AVA. Okay. AVA Cinema Remote with AVA OS and the new AVA Nano Brain Hub. I already hate it, but whatever. <laughs> Got some people excited as long as you weren't hoping for a Harmony type price, yes. which means it's going to be expensive. It's more expensive, yes. AVA already had the AVA Home Remote, which was just a touchscreen that ran Android with their own AVA app and interface available, but the AVA Cinema Remote changes things quite a bit. Technically, it's still entirely a touchscreen, but at the bottom, there's a physically raised ring to provide tactile feedback so you don't have to look at the remote to know what button you're pressing. The square area around the raised ring is also a touchpad that can dynamically change its buttons depending on what device you're controlling. And speaking of control, the new AVA OS makes this into an activity-based remote, although AVA calls them flows because whatever. <laughs> you can also load Android apps as well for the uh, use on the upper touch screen, which would be good for those of you that want to control your different devices you know, specifically that's right the ava cinema remote will be priced at 1300 bucks and while they will be selling through custom installers all of the programming is done directly on the remote itself and it sends out ir wi-fi and bluetooth commands so nothing else is necessary to get started if your installer keeps it unlocked and you're willing to dig into its setup a bit it will be possible to add devices and change the programming yourself and then there's the ava nano brain they do know that nano means small, right? So They do. <laughs> okay. That's the name of it. I can't change it. I got to say what it's named. I, know, I, I know. didn't make it up. It's a $400 hub with 360-degree IR blaster and three USB-C ports with optional IR extenders. The nano brain allows for out-of-sight equipment control, but it'll also synchronize with multiple cinema and home remotes throughout your house. That is kind of convenient. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So a full hub-based system will set you back $1,700, but it's the closest thing yet to a true Harmony replacement. One wrinkle, though. They're being sued by Snap One, which now can owns Control Four. Part of the led lawsuit alleges similarities to their Control, excuse me, to their Control Four Neo remotes. Neo, Neo. That's again, what they named it? N E E O. I don't know. I don't think these things. Oh. Neo. Search Anyways. engine optimization. <laughs> yeah. They're control for Neo remotes, so we might need to see how that plays out before getting too excited about the Ava Cinema remote and Nano Brain. You know, can't we just have nice things? <laughs> can't Apparently somebody just not. have nice things and not be stupid about it and like, oh, you've got it. that looks so not exactly the same as ours, but close enough that we think we can maybe. So you, you know, tie up enough of your funds so that you'll go out of business yeah. and then you, we won't have competition. Yeah. Do we have enough money to do that? We do? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> let's, I mean, let's, these let's are do that. Both essentially touchscreen rectangles. So I don't know that run Android, oh. which is freely available to anybody. So I don't know how things are going to go there. But yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, still still continue to keep a lookout. Uh, but yeah, the Ava, Ava Cinema Remote, if it ever comes to comes to market, then it could be an alternative as long as you're willing to pay the $1,700 price. Yes. Uh, before I forget yet again, because I've forgotten a couple times during this okay. podcast, I want to talk about this, the wireless speaker I'm using to watch on my computer because the, the, ah. the volume of my computer is not loud enough, right. but I don't want to do it right now. So you remind me. I'll try. At some point. <laughs> we'll see how we and go. And then it'll be your fault and not mine. That's right. So in breaking news, thanks, thanks to the FTC versus Microsoft lawsuit, details about Microsoft's Xbox control plans leaked out. Console Xbox, plans. Console. Consult, yes. Console plans leaked out. They apparently plan to release refreshes of the Xbox Series X and X. S and X. 
in September and November 2024, respectively. Reportedly, the new Xbox Series S will go back to a white case and still be priced at $300. It'll have a one terabyte solid state drive, just like the recent black case version, but it will use more recycled material and it will have a Wi-Fi 6E and... Did you hear that squeak coming out of my mouth just now? Not really. <laughs> I said six. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> it's not six. I can't even do it on purpose. Anyways, it'll have Wi Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2 built in, no big change. However, it will come with a new version of the Xbox controller, which gets a swappable rechargeable battery, module thumbsticks to, re to make replacement easier, new haptics. Uh, gyro and accelerometer and the ability to connect directly to cloud gaming the biggest changes come to the xbox series x it's apparently losing its disk drive it'll still cost 500 dollars, which now gives you uh two terabytes of built-in storage it also is going to be a cylinder instead of a very boxy box mm -hmm. there's nothing <laughs> Seems high tech, like I can roll off a table accidentally. I mean, I think and, what really happened is some people ended up stacking things on top of their exceedingly box shaped Xbox Series X, and they're like, "Nope, no stacking, make it round." Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's overheating or whatever. That's right. They're shrinking the processor by transitioning to a six nanometer process. Mm -hmm. Yep, which means it'll use less power and run more efficiently. So there you go. Yes, very exciting. Is there a picture? Is there, there are a picture there. on this? Oh, there's the cylinder. I see it. Yeah. You know what? It looks like an air an air purifier. A little bit. Or like looks, a Sonos speaker. <laughs> it looks very similar yeah. to a Sonos speaker. I hate the white version, too. I've always mm. hated that white version. I think it looks dumb. I mean, the, the I don't know. One thing, and, and I have lots of problems with Apple. Everybody knows this, right? But one thing Apple can do is make something in a strange shape that people still like. like <laughs> Aesthetically even the, pleasing even, industrial design, yeah. that is a hallmark of them, yes. Not I so mean, much that, Microsoft. That stupid uh, uh, CRT iMac that they made for a mm -hmm. while that was in all different colors. I remember when it came out and everybody went, oh, it's so dumb, and secretly went, but I want one. Many people do. <laughs> they seem to be doing all right selling stuff over there at Apple. They're doing all right. Yeah. I like how they take it. They're like, we've we've upgraded our iPhones to have USB-C for better connectivity. That's Everybody's right. Like, and now all I see is articles on my thing about how great the lightning plug connector you, ah, used right, to be. Yes. <laughs> Cause, Mainly because you got like a gazillion lightning cables in your room. <laughs> yeah. Now everybody's <laughs> mad that they can't have to throw them away. That's what it is. So also leaked are Microsoft's apparent plans to introduce their next generation of gaming in 2028. And not surprisingly, they seem to be aiming for a hybrid cloud-based system. I don't even know why they're giving out hardware anymore. It should just be a remote <laughs> right. be a remote that connects to the The leaked plans include switching to an ARM-based processing, which would mean any form of backwards compatibility would demand emulation. And they apparently intend to target next-gen ray tracing with an AMD AMD GPU and a thin OS that would leverage cloud-based processing to allow for game streaming on handheld devices and a sub $100 streaming stick. So your next Xbox will be a cylinder that <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that will fit in your hand and plug into the back of your TV. That's, that, that's that, yeah, be. yeah. I mean, nothing super surprising here, but they didn't want these these all of this stuff that we just talked about was supposed to be secret. It was supposed to be like not not released to the public because it was all during the lawsuit that's going on with the FTC right now. I think still to do with their acquisition of Activision. So it's like, but all of this stuff came out and The Verge reported on it. So there we go. We're just saying what they said. All right, uh, some corrections. All right, a correction or Two. some corrections? There's a couple of corrections. Two corrections. Yeah. Because okay. it does say corrections, plural. Roger, via YouTube comment, we recently talked about the new Denon X1800H receiver model. We said how we thought it was strange that they had removed the Zone 2 pre as compared to the 1700H model. We must have been looking at the images of the back panel for the European version. It's true that on that version, there are no Zone 2 pre-outs. But for the North American version, not only are there Zone 2 pre-outs present, they've also added a pair of front left and right channel pre-outs for, uh, for that, that the 1700 that did not have. They did not have this, that on them. So 1800 isn't such a bad deal after all. So there yeah, you go. yeah. So uh, yeah, very happy about that correction. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure where the original images uh, that uh, came up uh, were from. Although, like you said, yep, if it was the European version, that's exactly the case. No zone two preouts on that, or front left right preouts on uh, the European version for some reason. But you get more preouts now than ever before on the North American version. I do like this because this gives a 
not ridiculously expensive option if what you really want is a stereo preamplifier that still has right. all the modern features and this is like giving you uh, Odyssey Multi-Q XT room correction which you still don't find a lot of like stereo preamps so yes. it used to be that you had to go to basically the Marantz slimline uh, receivers to get this and just have a pair of pre-outs now on the current Marantz Cinema 70S slimline it has a full suite of 7.1 or 7.2 uh, pre-outs on that one uh, so now the model that you could look to that just has front left right pre-outs if that's all you need you could get a Denon X1800H I like that mm. the que next question though is anybody who's really looking for a stereo preamp going to buy an AV receiver full stop no matter what right because I you know for those just... in the know you can save some money that's all I'm saying <sighs> you can but you won't because everybody on Reddit will tell you that you're sacrificing <laughs> audio quality because your AV receiver does more That's things. That's not our fault or Dennis. Do. They're doing it right. Our second correction is from Herb from Cross Spectrum, uh, Spectrum Labs. And Sassy is what we're going with here? I think so. Yeah. Sassy? I'm not sure on the okay. pronunciation. S-A-S-I. Both call a mistake that Rob and Joe missed when we were talking about the new CDS CTARP22 immersive audio design recommended practices documented document last week. We we or they commented yes. on the background <laughs> noise uh, floor targets and laughed a bit about how they were recommended fifteen measurements. Fifteen right, measurements. Uh, to a reach. fifteen measurement. It just it just had the numeral fifteen there as the target yeah. under the level four. It seemed ridiculously low to reach a, uh, a noise floor level of 15, which I was, yes, assuming just meant decibels. Ah, but Herb and Sassy both caught that the, the 15 number is for the NCB rating noise criterion balance and not a decibel measurement, whether A-weighted or C-weighted. Furthermore, the RP22 document explains that their NCB rating is based on speech interference level from 500 to 4,000 hertz with additional tests for rumble and hiss. Herb let us know that what they're talking about uh, would be closer to about 29 dB A on a SPL meter A weighted, which is a much more reasonable and achievable target. So not 15 decibels, which is like yeah. ridiculously quiet. That's you're hearing your own heartbeat type of yeah background level. Yeah, this is this is much more achievable. This is a uh, quieter than a library, but you know around that type of level uh, for just your ambient background noise. So yes, that makes much more sense. And thank you very much for that correction. That is something that I overlooked. And uh, yeah, I mean I I had only read through that 144 page document the morning of the recording so you know what how dare I miss you that detail <laughs> how dare you miss that's something. right herb will never listen to us again everything we've ever said is totally invalid now yes yeah or he's not even a fan he doesn't even can't be how could us. you be anymore Every time I watch a show like House or anything that they have like this super expert on something and somebody walks in and says you have something random and they're like, actually, in this document, blah, 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 it, it, this is what it says, quote, quote, quote. I'm like, Jesus, no one does that. No one knows these things. <laughs> you know, this just came out yesterday and I've read it and it's this yeah. is what it says. And here, let me quote it. No. Okay. That's some people's job. That's some people's job. Not ours, though. Comments from listeners. James heard a couple of the questions last week about using the eco mode on Dan and Morant's receivers. He wanted to share his experience since he has settled on leaving uh, both his uh, living room 5.1.2 setup and his home cinema 7.1.2 setup in the auto eco mode. All of his speakers are powered by the receivers themselves, and he's never experienced any downside to the sound quality or dynamics. It really does seem to work as promised to save some energy when possible. The relay on the power supply does click sometimes in his setup. He has barely ever noticed it, but as Rob mentioned, if you're super picky about that, you want to put your receiver outside of your home, your theater room. And just as a reminder, if you're finding your Denon receiver running hot to the touch, it's probably the video processing more than the built-in amplifiers generating the excess heat, which has almost always been the case. Yep. <laughs> but yes, most of the times, like even those Onkyos that caught on fire so many years ago. It was, it was the, the HDMI video. boards. Yep. <laughs> it was the video processing, not the rest of it. By default, video conversion and IP scaling are set to on so that you will get the on-screen volume readout. But as long as you're willing to give that up, you can save a bunch of wasted heat and probably prolong the life of your HDMI board by turning the video conversion off. It made way more difference than it should for the heat coming off both his both of his Denon receivers. So there you go. Yep. Okay. Let's talk briefly about uh, this um, 
okay speaker i'm using for so i i reviewed this i'll, I'll, I'll put the link uh someplace in the here but i uh reviewed the soundcore motion x600 portable speaker which okay. is like a i mean it is it is small it is a small ish speaker with a handle on it and i've been i you know it's it kind of sat around this house and not really doing much with it um but i decided to pull it out for um for this particular uh watching video yeah. stuff because it is so small i can just throw it on my bed you know that's the speaker sitting you know m less than my leg length away from me right mm -hmm. and it's got a spatial audio button which i'm kind of made fun of i think mm -hmm. in the review mm -hmm. somewhat um and mostly because it's dumb <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's not really spatial audio it's it's just a dsp like yeah, trying to make of you course. fake surround sound that sort of thing first of all i did like the speaker and the review got it was a positive review i did like the speaker it's got a lot of bass it's sound and song quality is very good the spatial audio is like whatever it doesn't really make any difference and it doesn't in 99 percent of the time mm -hmm. but the fact that it's sitting right there right next to me i was like i'm just gonna turn it on because it's yeah. a button on top so i turned it on yes right oh my god <laughs> it did, it, it, if you're gonna sit just like that, where the speaker, if you're like ah, you're okay. using it to augment yeah, yeah, your yeah. your 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 computer screen or your your laptop, and you sit the speaker directly in front of you, just like a sound bar that has mm. the the fake surround. Mm -hmm. It does work. Okay. You know what I mean, it does work. Like I was watching Star Wars Rebels, and they walked off the screen talking, and the sound ah right. <laughs> Move to my right. Yep. So I just wanted to, to to give the a little bit of props to this speaker. Yep. That if you are, if you that is the if you're into that, and you're like, okay, well, I just want something that sounds pretty good that I can take anywhere. I can do a bunch of stuff with. I mean, I better mean, than your built-in laptop speakers, right? Oh, and it gets so loud. Okay. Too. It's yeah. like ridiculous. Like I don't think I've. There's been a couple of YouTube videos that are very, very, very soft, mm -hmm. right? And even with those, I don't think I've had this thing over 60%. Okay. And this volume. I mean, it gets loud. Nice. So, yes. All right. Questions. Scott and Jorge. Scott and Jorge. Scott is using an NVIDIA Shield, a non-pro tube-shaped model. This is with tubes today. I don't know. They don't want stuff getting stacked. That's all I can think. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if home theater gear just ended up looking like a bunch of right. tubes? <laughs> it's just like this Not place on the question. side of them. <laughs> it's like, it's just look like Lincoln Logs. The, <laughs> yep. A Lincoln Log home theater gear. That's what we should have. Nice. Uh, Scott is using an NVIDIA Shield non-pro tube-shaped model with a Denon X3600H and a JVC DLA X30 projector, which is 1080p, HDMI 1.4. <laughs> and he's got a 5.1 speaker setup. When he plays something from Disney+, Plus, Amazon Prime, or most other streaming services, pressing info on his Denon shows the incoming format as Dolby Digital+, Plus, with the input and output signals as 5.1 is expected. But for <laughs> some reason... Just with Netflix, yeah, it only shows a two-channel stereo signal coming in. It still reports it as being a Dolby Digital uh, Plus container and signal, but just two-channel and not uh, two-channel stereo and not 5.1. He couldn't find any audio settings to change in the Netflix app. So, any ideas? Yeah. Uh, so Netflix does have. Uh, you know, original 5.1 and then stereo. And it usually defaults to the original 5.1 for mine. Usually. But I don't know why that would be different for you. Yeah, that's not all. a bad thing to check. Is like act as something is actually playing. This isn't like a, a settings menu thing in the app or online. This is like when the video is actually playing, checking the audio track, just like how you can optionally turn on subtitles. You can optionally, while the video is playing, check right. the audio settings. So that... That isn't a bad I thing to check. I just hit info or whatever or, or yeah. something, and it pops up like the. It's like near the subtitles. Yeah. I mean, on on a Shield or Apple TV, you often often just press the up button on the you know directional yes. pad, and that'll yes. just bring up those things, and you can navigate to that. So that that is, yeah. I mean, I know that sounds a bit pedantic, but that's not a bad thing to check. Who knows? Maybe at some point it got switched to stereo and remembered that you watch something <laughs> in stereo. It's it's not out of the question. Uh, the other thing that I thought of was um, because you wouldn't find this under any sort of audio or video settings, uh, and you would have to make this change either on your computer or on your phone app version of Netflix, which 
it's not out of the question if you're using an Android phone that the NVIDIA Shield is actually pulling the mobile version of the Netflix app and might have been using any settings that you set in your Android phone. It's, it, again, yeah. not out of the question. So this is actually under the data savings uh, menu in, in those settings, particularly on the app, where if you set it to data saver or if you set it to low on the web version, that is limited to stereo audio. It will never output 5.1. It will only output stereo from Netflix if you set it to the data saver on your mobile version or if you've set it to the low uh, data usage on the web version. So set that to medium or high uh, or on the mobile app version, I think they only give you data saver or auto. I think those are the only two options. Uh, but if you have, I mean, I'm I'm thinking maybe on your phone you set it to data saver. That's not out of the question if you maybe don't have oodles and oodles of data on your plan. Um, and it's not out of the question that if there's an Android phone that the NVIDIA Shield is actually pulling the mobile version of the settings, what it's doing, because like, it's all working off of Android, uh, both of those devices. So that's something you could check and not necessarily in an intuitive looking in the audio video settings because it's not there. It's in the data saver settings. Uh, but if it's none of that, then we're not sure. Um, but I, at least that's something you might not have thought to check and, and could be the reason. He says it's all, all all the shows on Netflix. It's not just one. Right? It's everything it's just, on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. And then the other apps on his NVIDIA Shield are not doing this. It's only right. Netflix. That's why I'm like... It, it could be it's something be like the mo the mobile app setting yeah. or something, like that. or yeah. like like Tom suggested, it could just be that while you were watching something, maybe it got switched to stereo. So, could be pedantic, but worth checking. Yeah, and Jorge just started having almost the reverse problem. He's using the 2017 <laughs> Nvidia Shield. Everything was working fine until a few days ago. He didn't change any settings. He didn't make note of any firmware update happening. But now, two channel stereo signals aren't properly working for him. His shield is. Plugged into his Den X4400H receiver, surround sound signals from his from any of his streaming devices or from Plex all work perfectly fine. But if he plays a movie or TV show that uses a stereo two-channel audio signal, it's either no signal or exceedingly quiet. <laughs> he also noticed that the system sounds when you're navigating around the menus have all disappeared. Any ideas? Uh, no. So thankfully, <laughs> uh, Jorge ended up solving this on his own between last week and this week. Uh, and you know what? I vaguely remember having having mentioned this before years ago, uh, but this is something that he did find. He wrote back to say himself that he found the solution. This is on the Shield itself under the advanced section of the Shield's audio settings. Uh, there's a little check mark there where you can say uh, output fixed volume level. And that's just because the Shield does have volume up and down buttons of its own on its remote. Sure. But this just sets a fixed output level so that you're adjusting the volume on your TV or on your AV receiver rather than the shield itself uh, adjusting its volume input and output. So it's like a fixed line level signal when you toggle that on. Well, I mean, he didn't do anything. And as far as he was aware, there was no like system level update, but he toggled it off, toggled it back on, and now stereo signals were fine. <laughs> and his navigation button clicks and things like that were fine. It was just some glitch in the system where, you know, the, the fixed volume level got set way, 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 way too low. But all he had to do was toggle that off and back on again, and it all started working fine. So wonderful stuff. Uh, happy that that got sorted out for Jorge. I hope we are going to be able to set out Scott's issues with those suggestions. But there you go. Some NVIDIA Shield fun with stereo audio signals. <sighs> <laughs> the old turn it off, turn it back on. Yeah, but no, but I mean, that's I mean, that's a specific setting that you got to dig down in the menus I know, a bit that's to so find. Dumb. So it, it, it's funny, and it, this makes me think of my car, which I hate. My I, I love, I have a Forerunner, uh, okay. which I did not realize when I bought was a soccer mom car, but it is. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that, but I got it, and now I'm stuck <laughs> with it. And I do like my car, I yeah. do. It, it's, it, it's, it's fine. But the Bluetooth sucks, right? And it's so finicky, like half, you know, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm, it, it, mm -hmm. I'll go months and it'll be fine. And then every once in a while, and then for like a, like three weeks straight, I won't, it won't be yeah. able to connect to my yeah. phone. I have to turn the car back and off and on. And if you disconnect your phone from the Bluetooth, you can't reconnect it mm -hmm. while you're, it won't, it won't find it. It's just really annoying. But every once in a while, if I do something just right, like <laughs> I do something just right and, and I get like a, like a, like a, a, a text message as a song is starting on mm -hmm. Pandora or whatever I'm doing, the volume on the song will be a quarter of what it is. Okay. And I won't be able to get, and the only way to get it to stop, the, to go back to the regular volume is to, is to pause it and restart yeah. the song. Yeah. But it, 
sometimes I have to do it from the the head unit in the car, and sometimes I have to do it from my phone. I yep. have to do it back of. It's just sort of so you know. I think technology is great, and it never Flawless. it never has any problems whatsoever. So I'm sure that Foolproof. Sony thing that they were talking about earlier, yes. where you're, they're just going to take their DSP and shove it into an Atmos container. That's right. I'm sure that will work. Guaranteed. Exactly as promised. Whatever it says on the tin, that's what's going to come out. That's right. Guaranteed. Uh, as long as it's, a, it's the device is a cylinder. <laughs> so it, it's the not key. a cylinder. It, cl it clearly isn't high tech. I, I don't know. Scott was using the cylinder Nvidia Shield and it had a problem. And we don't well, even know if we're going to fix it. Let's. You know what you should do? The first thing you should do is you should check the roundness of it. Because if it's mm. not perfectly round, that's probably your problem right there. Must have been. The case is the wrong shape. Maybe it's slightly oblong. <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan came across a DIY fan-based rotary subwoofer project that was literally all over the internet the last couple of weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, this isn't was, a super new idea, but whatever. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've seen this exact image yeah. half a dozen times at okay. least. Uh, it was built for around $200 in parts, not counting uh, reusing an existing subwoofer as a physical base and transducing piston including the rotor uh, linkage to from a model helicopter. Yeah. So if you look at it, it's a clearly meant to cut your cat in half device that be. has been cobbled together and it has a fan and blade on the front. That's right. And it, 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 when you first see it, you're going to think it just has these little metal fan blades, but look closer. There are clear plastic that's right. Blades connected to and those metal parts. The way this is working, so the fan itself is only rotating in one direction. But yes. in order to get the air to vibrate, there is a subwoofer driver, and it looks like it's probably an eight inch subwoofer driver. So yes. that is moving back and forth in response to the signal, as you would expect. That movement is tied to the model helicopter linkage, which swivels the fan blades back and forth so that while the fan is continuing to rotate in the same direction, the direction that the air moves oscillates back and forth based on the uh, pivoting and swiveling of the fan blades themselves, which are going back and forth in response to the movement of the regular subwoofer drivers. So the idea that this was $200 in parts, that is, it, it was definitely more Ludicrous. than that because they were just yes. like, yeah, he already took a subwoofer that he had and didn't count that as part of the price, uh, yeah. disassembled it. So there you go. Yeah, because everybody's just got, I mean, other than Rob, everybody's got right. subwoofers just lying around. I mean, I do have subwoofers lying around, but nothing that small. I would have to, yeah. you know, repurpose a 12-inch driver, which seems like a waste. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of this that seems like a waste. <laughs> so playing subsonic frequencies down to one hertz, it physically shakes his house and makes all the doors vibrate like crazy. Johnson mostly finds it hilarious, but what do we think? Um, I mean, we've talked about uh, subsonic or infrasonic, really, yes. is what the, the, the proper name for it. That's infrasonic right. frequencies uh, multiple times on this podcast, and I have I am convinced that you cannot hear them or feel well, them or anything with them. So but I mean, the way that are hearing is the noise that everything else <laughs> is right. making as those infrasonic waves hit them. Yes. So does that add anything to your sonic experience? Yes, it adds noise that you That's didn't right. want to be there in the first place. But you, thankfully, now you have the stupid fan thing to make your house vibrate. So well, I yes. guess... And it should be clarified, like, uh, we're seeing an image of it just sitting on the floor in his office or whatever, but the way that he uses this is he actually has all of this thing that he constructed outside of his house with the fan blades in an open window and then, you know, constructed a you know seal to go around that and a thing to hold the uh, yeah. the whole thing up at the correct height. Um, so, like, this thing is going in a window because the, the back wave air or, or where the air is being drawn in or whatever, oh, I mean, it's oscillating, so air is going in and out. Uh, like, that is has to be an infinite baffle, so he just uses the great outdoors as his infinite right. baffle. So all of this is actually in a window uh, outside of that. And then he's like, yeah, the, the entire house physically shakes in response to it. That's something that his sub didn't necessarily do but it's like no, none of it is audible by definition none of it is yeah. audible it is yeah. infrasonic it's you know it's dumb it's it's dumb <laughs> and it's not practical and listen i live in florida many of you live in places where you have weather mm -hmm. i imagine mm -hmm. that where it's not a, a temperate Right, you know, normal temperature that would that, that where you would just sit with your windows open all day and all year long. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that you would not want to have your room have access 
<laughs> and I mean, if you've ever had Constantly issues out, right outdoors. with yeah. soundproofing your bass before, just imagine like literally attaching a vibrating thing to the entire structure of your house and that's how you're going to experience your base so look i mean yeah, there, there's people who just want physical shaking i still say just like i said last week go ahead and strap a butt kicker to your seat because i don't yeah, mind that not? i don't yeah. mind that 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 i'm completely fine with somebody doing that uh that seems like the more reasonable solution to me and it's certainly the more localized solution that uh won't upset your wife uh so there you go Unless she's sitting on the couch, in which case it could yeah. upset your wife. No, but not so much when Bert she's sitting in the washroom like this thing did. Right. Bertrand's in, in Quebec. Bertrand might be moving to a new place, which would mean saying goodbye to his totally blacked out, small, dedicated theater room. <laughs> Between last week, when he asked this question, and this week, it turns out that he's probably staying in his current place, but still a good exercise. We'll go ahead and answer the question anyways. The new place would be a condo on the first floor of a three-story building. He has an enclosed, long, narrow, rectangular room that is currently set up as the living slash dining room. And there's a bike in there, so that's the only thing I care about. All right. It's crap. <laughs> <laughs> it is hardwood floors. There are windows all over the place. Well, and, not, uh, I mean, there's there's two windows and then a, and a, a glass door, door into the rest of the house with with frosted glass on the on that door. Yeah. So he's thinking he'd like to set this room up lengthwise. It would be 11 and a half wide by 24 feet long by 9 feet high. Mm -hmm. He doesn't plan to buy any, any new home theater gear right away, so he still be using his 77-inch LG CX OLED and with his Marantz uh, SR8015 receiver and nine Martin Logan speakers with dual SVS SB1000 Pro subs for seating. He has three power recliners. I like our take on the best layout. He was thinking he just put his TV on the short wall uh, where there's currently a mirror. So one end has a mirror and a wall, and the other end of the, the long way as we're going. That's right. Uh, has a window to the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, that would put the large window on the back wall. The front half of the room would be the theater area, and he put his two subwoofers at the midpoint of the side walls, meaning they'd both be slightly behind the seats. He could put his standing desk directly behind the seat, so he's still facing the front speakers and the TV while he's working there, and the back half of the room could be a sitting area, the current TV mount. Uh, by the window would be removed. Do we agree with that being the best layout, or would we arrange things in a different way? So just as an exercise, this is one of these, like, do you always try to set up things, uh, you know, longer than they are wide? When does it make more sense to set things up wider than they are long? When does it make sense to set things up? Basically the way that this person in the photos already has things where, you know, that right half of the room is the right. living room area and the left half of the room is the dining room area. So your theater area, if you did it that way, would be totally open the on the left, but have a window on the right. Sort of bisects it, but not really. And it's the door, more, it yeah. Seems yeah, it seems so like So this, this is just a good area. exercise for, you know, because I mean, look, most of us are going to come into pre-existing rooms. Most of us aren't fortunate yes. enough to be building a dedicated theater from scratch. So just the looking at the placement of windows, doors, the layout of the room, how do you determine what the best orientation is when you're faced with something like this? So sonically, as far as, you know, where you're going to put speakers and mm -hmm. stuff like that, the TV that's it's currently placed, which like, as Robin mm -hmm. described, it's on one half of the room. Like if you cut the room in half, it would be on the, you know, the long wall, but only yeah. one half of the wall makes it almost impossible to put real speakers to right. the sides, to one side of It'd it. You'd be blocking the to... door on the left-hand yeah. side of where things currently are. The people there right now just seem to be using the TV's built-in speakers like so many do. And just like these people already have it, it gives you almost no other option than to have your seats right up against the back wall. There's not yeah. a whole lot else that you could do. Yeah. So, you know, the other option, of course, is to put it on one of the small walls. And yeah. on one side, you end up having like a direct reflection from the the window behind which would be behind the seats yeah onto the screen or the other way which blocks the window that's right would be you know so you end up having to like decide what's important to you in this room mm -hmm. so for me if it was my room i would put blackout curtains over the, mm -hmm. the window and put the tv in front of the window yeah and that would and be it, my preference too um and, and also because at the other end where there's this mirror there is uh, a door on the right hand side of that that opens yeah. into this room so if you have your speakers set up on either side of your tv on the uh, short wall that is opposite the window. If you do all that, well, then you got to be very careful whenever you open that door swinging into this room to make sure it doesn't crash into your front right speaker, which would be basically set up right there where that door is swinging in. So if I were doing this, I 
myself being a bachelor living on my own. I right. don't care so right. much if I'm blocking the view of the window. So I would still set it up this room longer than it is wide, but I have my TV stand in front of the window. There's nothing to the left and the right of that window. So I can absolutely put my front left and right speakers there and not have to worry about anything knocking into them. There's a slight concern that, yes, you have the heat register below that window. So I might want to bring everything forward enough that I'm not blasting hot air directly into the back of any of my electronic components. But other than that, I think that would be the way I would set up this room. And then you just got to be a little bit careful at seating placement so that when those frosted doors open on the left, it's not knocking into a chair. Right. But uh, so, yeah, that would be the way I would do it. And so the argument on the other side would be, oh, I want to have access to that window from time That's to right. time. And, and you know, I want to be able to, I mean, even if I put blackout curtains there so that there wouldn't be a reflection on my TV when I'm watching it, I could still open it from time mm -hmm. to time and, That's and right. kind of enjoy it. But I'm hearing how you're going to have this room set up. Your back would be to the window when you're working, which means That's your, right. computer, your computer desk, your computer screens would be basically getting that same reflection. Mm -hmm. you're, there's almost going to never be a time that you're really going to want to open that window. And yeah. you know it'll be easier than opening that window or opening the blinds that cover that window? Going to a room that already has windows uncovered. Sure. <laughs> Just like walking yeah. out. Because you're really not going to be doing anything in here other than working. Yeah. And if that's the case, you know, there is another window in this room that you can that's use for correct. natural light. Yeah. That one can be opened or closed for natural light from time to time. And that yeah. would be to the side of your work area. And some light I, will be coming I, I like, in through those, those frosted glass in that door as well if you have yeah. a light on in the rest of the house. Yeah. Yeah. So he has one of the APC BR 1350MS gaming performance battery backup units that we've often recommended. He bought almost exactly two years ago. He, really, he recently found it flashing F. O2 and F04 error at him. F02, F04. Yeah. He's tried unplugging it and replugging it, which is always the first and <laughs> most accurate solution, and resetting the battery, but it just keeps flashing those errors. What happened? Can he get it fixed under warranty from APC? I will tell you that I also have some APCs in here of those okay. gaming things that my whole computer is is. My, my I have two computers and blah blah blah, and when we moved everything away, f you know, so that we could they could do some repairs in here, uh, everything got unplugged from the wall only, mm -hmm. from the wall only, and then we moved everything back because we couldn't walk through the house, and the and we needed everything to be plugged. I plugged it back in, and I'm pretty sure that I, I am now discovering that my the battery on that thing is probably dying. It's just outlived mm. its its usefulness and i just have to get another one but uh i would imagine that's what's happening here but i don't know because i didn't look up these errors so rob what's going on yeah um sorry i'm not sure if tom is talking right now because our skype seems to have had an issue there but uh i can just say that uh the fo2 and the fo4 errors the fo4 error in particular which is uh I mean, it, what what you'll see is like, it's just the the surge clamp <laughs> has been tripped. Uh, the FO2 usually refers to a fuse uh, having blown. So both of those are more or less indications that uh, you had either one large or, or more than one large surge event uh, at your place where you're using this, or uh, you had several you know smaller surge events that might not have necessarily noticed that anything had gone wrong in particular, but um, the the APC does use just a metal oxide varistor, a MOV, as its surge protection, and it is cumulative. It, it has a lifespan, and as you have, uh, you know, one or more surge events going on, not necessarily some kind of kind of gigantic surge or lightning strike or anything like that, uh, but just as you have multiple surge events that go on, that uh, metal oxide varistor eventually um, uh, comes to the end of its lifespan, and it does what it was designed to do, which is protect the rest of your gear from uh, having a surge get through to it, that is in all likelihood what has happened here. Um, so if that's the case, uh, I mean, I would still get in touch with APC. That's the first thing to do. Uh, there is sometimes the case where this is a battery issue and it's not actually that the fuse or the MOV has uh, had any problems. Sometimes it is just uh, that you know, there's an issue with the battery. The batteries are supposed to last, you know, between three to five, um, you know, uh, years. So there's a possibility that if it's a battery issue that uh, you, you could get that fixed under warranty. It's not uh, a problem if you go ahead and uh, contact APC about that. But... Uh, given what those errors mean, uh, the likelihood is that you had some surge events going on. And 
you wouldn't necessarily expect to have that replaced under warranty because the, the device did what it's supposed to do. It sacrificed itself so that your other equipment that it's protecting could live. So either way, get in touch with APC, uh, but it definitely could be the case that what went on there uh, was that it did exactly what a surge protector is supposed to do and it sacrificed itself uh, to save something else. And just being aware that it is those those MOVs that are cumulative as strikes happen through over the couple of years that you've had it, uh, sometimes small strikes, uh, that cumulative effect eventually causes that MOV to uh, melt <laughs> and it breaks the connection. And one thing I like about APC uh, protection products is once that MOV trips, it doesn't let the electricity through. There are other surge protectors that essentially open instead of closing and they let you keep using it, but now you have no surge protection after that MOV is gone. APC does it the correct way, the safer way, which is it closes it so that nothing gets through and it's like, hey, something's wrong and that's what those F error messages are telling you. Yeah. It's very exciting. I heard parts of that. That's right. So that, that's I'm good. sure you'll listen back afterwards. That's what Tom I'm always going does. To. Um, so I'm going to press a button and it might delete, it might stop our call. You'll have to call me right back. <laughs> okay. We'll okay. see what goes because on. We're having the, some technical issues as we're we go We're having some technical flight. issues. So my internet, like I'm wireless right now. My wireless gotcha. connection never dropped, but my internet dropped, which means oh. it came from the company. Okay. But right now Skype is, you are calling me Oh. right now. Okay. Can you stop Fun. calling me? <laughs> uh, there's nothing I can do on my end, so we can okay, hang up I'm this gonna call. Hit the, I'm going hit, hit, to hit the hang up on this and see what happens. Okay. All right. Okay. It's, 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 <laughs> I don't know what's happening here. Fun I stuff. Is away. it refusing to hang up? No, I think I got it. Okay. okay. So we were back. Yep. And we're on to Daz. Daz. Daz wanted to try a tweak as suggested on YouTube with his dual SB12 NSD subwoofers in his basement home theater. They have always been a bit underpowered for the volume of air he was dealing with. But this tweak suggested increasing the gain on the subwoofers themselves and then lowering the receiver's trim levels for calibration. While doing that, he discovered the subwoofer at the back of his room wasn't playing at all. He swapped <laughs> sub positions and the problem followed the sub, so something was wrong. He contacted the SVS and they had him do a bump test with a 9 volt battery. Long story short, the sub driver would bump once when touching the battery to its leads, but then wouldn't bump again unless he manually moved the driver with his hand. It seems one of the internal wire connections to the woofer itself is not fully connected anymore. He sent his serial number and proof of purchase to SVS. Being that the 12 NS, uh, 12, SB12 NSD isn't a model they sell anymore. <laughs> yeah, like for a long time. Been a while. Uh, they can't afford a direct repair or replacement. He's trying to think. Uh, if they won't he, offer a direct if they repair won't, replacement. If they can't offer a direct repair pl uh, replacement, he's trying to think through his best course of action. He got his house renovations underway, so he's very budget-minded at the moment. He'd be all over a subwoofer upgrade otherwise, but it turns out that he basically needs to pay full price or close, but if it turns out that he needs to pay full price or close to it, what do you think he should do? He put aside about $3,000 that was earmarked for a new mountain bike. First of all, road bikes are better. Let's just... <laughs> Not if you are mountain biking. I would definitely rather have it if I'm actually doing that activity. You, I don't see. There's the problem right there is that yes. you're doing the wrong activity. You should I be gotcha. road biking and not mountain. <laughs> I like mountain biking too. I'm only joking, but it could go towards a new subwoofer instead. As a reminder, the current model, the current room is about twelve and a half by seven and a half tall, twelve and a half wide by seven and a half tall to the drop of how it's feeling. But then it's twenty nine feet long and it's T shaped with an opening to the basement walkway a hallway. Do we think dual SVS PB three thousands he has in mind would be appropriate choice? I mean. Normally, whenever you say "open to everything else," I don't. <laughs> I don't necessarily love suggesting you in the air, in the direction of SVS. Not because they don't make subwoofers that can handle it, because they do, but because you can usually get something a little bit cheaper from someplace like Power Sound Audio or Rhythmic or something, or particularly where, Monoprice Monolith right oh, now. Right. Uh, you know, which is he, he's also a fan of Monoprice. So yeah, something like the. I mean, if you can physically fit them, something like yes. the Monolith uh, M15 V2 cost significantly less while basically having the same output capabilities as a PB4000. Uh, you're, you're more or less right there with a PB4000 output and extension uh, on the monolith for considerably less money. So just budget-wise, I would probably be looking at a monolith myself. So the only thing that, and I like monoprice, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. I like monoprice. The thing about monoprice is that you pay, you're basically part of the, of the 
value that you get for not paying as much or part of the cost of not paying so much is their customer service is notoriously horrible. Okay. <laughs> so, so you will, if you do have a problem with one of their products, right. you are normally completely and totally out of luck. They ah. will do little to help you. That's mm. like universally. The I've right? almost never read anybody saying I had a good experience with mm. Mono Price customer <laughs> service. So that's the only a caveat I will give yep. to that. And I am the uh, kind of person who... A reasonable who, caveat because we know yeah. how excellent SVS's customer service is. And actually, we're going to hear about that from Daz yeah. himself in just a moment here. So just be... For those of you that are like, oh, they always suggest mono price. I'm going to get mono price. I, I do think have, there's no problem with you getting mono price. But I will say, if you do get mono price and you do have a problem, you're it's not going to be a fun time for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, there's also like shoe, shoe research, uh, HSU, yes. you know, you got your VTF3, Mark, whatever they're up to their now. Customer and customer service is good as well. Their VTF 15H, Mark II, I mean, those are tremendous value subwoofers. So just yeah. purely price-wise, that I would probably be looking at an alternative because, yeah, exactly like Tom says, once we get to the, oh, we really want some beefy output, then there are just ones that can match SVS's output for less money, that's all. So as it turns out, uh, between when he asked his question last week and when we're recording today, SVS got back to him about the SB12 and SDs to put things in perspective. He bought his subs through a third-party marketplace seller on Amazon and definitely more than five years ago, which was the length of the warranty. But despite all of that and no expectations at all on Daz's part, SVS went ahead and sent him a replacement 12-inch driver, no charge. Yeah. Daz told his wife and she said, we have achieved brand loyalty. There you go. Yeah, so there you go. That's why he might be looking at a different model and sticking with SVS. And there yes. you go. That's exactly what you're maybe paying a little bit more at the outset. But if you get service like that, it can be worth it. Uh, so now that he has the malfunctioning driver on hand, any suggestions for how to get rid of it? Dealing with e-waste in his area remains a challenge. I would one bajillion percent put that on SV on, on Facebook Marketplace for zero dollars is what I would do. Okay. And say like, listen. There's this is what they said is wrong with it. Yeah, they they sent me a replacement. I don't want to throw this in, into a landfill. Yeah, if you can fix it, or if you want to try yeah. to fix it, or or just use I'm, it for parts, right? Maybe you just yes. need the magnet or then something, right? Come get it. Uh, yeah. The other thing that you could do is if you have a local high school that has programs in electrical engine, you know, electrical programs or mm -hmm. you know, metal work or I mean, almost anything. I would, I would imagine that you could donate it to them okay. to do something with. Because I know like our, my son's, uh, one of his, I've had two sons, two different high schools. And uh, one of them, had their high school has the type of programs, the type of teachers that I think would be like, oh yeah, I can do something with that. Mm -hmm. And they would. So um, that's what I would do with it. Okay. Yeah. So, Oh, all right. That's the end of that. Back when he was getting his projection screen for the first time, this is still Daz, we went through all of the deter determining factors with him and he said he should get a 110-inch screen size. He wound up getting 120-inch, mostly because found he found an open box deal. Having lived with it for quite a while now, it turns out we were right originally and a slightly smaller screen would have worked better. It's just a matter of inches, but it would have given him just enough wiggle room to better position all three of his front speakers and the field of view would have been just right. As an aside, when they went to see Gran Turismo, it was in the Screen X theater with the two additional screens along the sides to completely fill in your peripheral vision. He didn't care for it. The screen material on the two side screens was not the same as the main screen. You could <laughs> really see the difference in colors and brightness. When they were uh, dedicated images for the side screens, it was mildly okay, but obviously uh, nothing important to look at. And the rest of the time, they were just blurry, distorted, stretched portions of the content he was already looking that straight ahead of him can't see that catching on but back again to his home, his own theater he's basically in a wait and see moment since his, his contractor told him that shrinking the basement bathroom to make his theater rectangular would not be complicated at all and definitely could be done uh, but the kitchen reno comes first then they'll decide so he's just looking to bounce ideas off of us there's basically three options Option number one, no best basement reno, but shrink the screen so that everything fits better. Would uh, would it be best to go with silver ticket like we originally suggested? Two, 
basement reno happens, allowing him to rotate his whole theater up to 180 degrees. The larger screen could probably stay in this case, or three. He's really considering switching to a very large flat panel now. <laughs> We've been talking about the relatively affordable 98 and 100 inch options, and then TCL might be bringing their new 115 inch model next year. And if that's the goal, then he could just hang on to his current screen for the time being, no matter what. What, what are our thoughts? I like option three. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, honest, there's that. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you as much as <laughs> I think that, I mean, so you are right now at the point where you're like, eh, I want to change things around a little bit. Things are going to get changed around. No matter what you did with the basement reno, mm -hmm. I kind of still feel like the real direction of home theater is ultra short throw projectors, which I think are going to be niche forever and never, ever <laughs> really be, never really catch on. And it's going to be law, very large flat panel displays. Right. That is the future. That is everybody's, not just yours, it's everybody's. All these people are like, I'm never giving up my projection. So that, shut up, you are. You're <laughs> going to when it gets big enough. If we're talking field of view and you're yes. like, well, I went with the 120 and I actually ended up wanting my seats just a little farther back than I had originally planned. Yeah. Turns out 110 would have been perfect. I mean, if you take a 98 inch or the high sense 100 inch and put it on a TV stand instead of mounting it completely flat on the wall, you're going to have the same field of view as that 110 inch without having moved your seat. <laughs> you don't you don't have to move your seat at all. You're just going to put the TV on a stand instead of wall mounting it or put it on a uh, slightly articulating mount. Uh, yeah. Although once you get to that screen size, you do have to be careful about just structural integrity because the 100 inch screens are pretty heavy. Um, but, you know, putting that on a TV stand can do this with a minimum of changes. So, for the moment, for the moment, you have Renos that you've got of an important one in the kitchen that hasn't even started yet. That's priority number one. I, I would, my recommendation, what I would do is I'm not touching the theater right now. Forget it. I am standing pat. I am not buying a new screen. I am not buying the new TV even right now. I'm standing pat with what I have, and we're going to see how these Renos go. But yes. after that, I agree with Tom. I would be leaning pretty strong because, uh, I mean, we know that his theater, as nice as it is, he's done a really nice job in his basement theater, but there are people coming and going out of the basement door door frequently it yeah. is not 100 blacked out like what you can do with now a 98 inch tcl or a 100 inch high sense and like that that's the way i would go so i'm telling you if, i am never buying another bulb for this projector right yeah i'm gonna tell you that right now that's yep. not gonna happen those are I our thoughts to, Daz. i have to <laughs> this bulb will probably last me another three or five three years probably it could be yeah two years and i just gotta make sure that my house isn't that there's nothing <laughs> terrible that happens to the house. Right. So I, I'll have I'll have another kid out of the college that we won't be there you paying go. for. We'll have a little bit extra money around here, and I'm going to be like, I'm gonna, I'm going to start sowing those seeds, <laughs> talking about that. Sounds like a good idea. All right, Rob, not this Rob, different Rob. Do we have more than one Rob? Do I have to say the last initial here? Oh, there are more than one Rob's. Yes, yes. So. Okay. So or uh, not, not this week, though, I guess. No, so. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this, <laughs> okay, this is Rob. Right? Misunderstood. If, if, if what your you name mean. is Rob and you're not sure if this is your question, you're about to find out. That's right. Rob has recently moved into a new house. He can finally install his full 7.2.4 speaker system, but he isn't keen on making any large holes in the ceiling. So his four, for four his, so for his four, that is a lot of fuck. Sorry. <laughs> overhead speakers he's opting to install them as heights instead of getting in ceilings he already owns four arendelle sealed six inch deep 1961 bookshelf speakers he wants to uh, to wall mount them up high these particular speakers are a little different than uh in that on the back they include a 100 by 100 ves visa vesa vesa right i, I always know. say visa but i mean visa -E -S -A. yeah v-e-s-a -E anyways the mounting holes rather than the typical keyhole mount or Single or double threaded insert. Arendelle sells their own Visa Vesa 100 wall mount, but it's only is flush mount only. And Rob wants to mount uh, that can tilt and swivel so that he can aim his height speakers. Mm -hmm. Probably doesn't need that, but whatever. He found this pair of speaker wall mounts from Pile for thirty-two dollars. The included mounting bracket has holes that would fit. Uh, Two out of the four Visa mounting holes, but not all four. He likes that the adjustments lock into place at fixed increments rather than being fully adjustable and relying on friction. But his Airedale speakers only weigh about 11 pounds, so maybe that isn't vital. These pile mounts can be adjusted to either tilt or swivel, not both. So can we point to any Visa, Vesa, whatever, 100 mounts <laughs> that we think would work well for him? 
I don't know. So I, I mean, bookshelf speakers, honestly. If you did go with those pile wall mounts, uh, there's there's no problem just using two instead of all four because the weight of the speakers is not so dramatic that there's going to be any sort of worry about having two of those uh, screws secured rather than all four. That is not an issue. Um, I mean, to me, I would be perfectly fine having your height speakers, you know, coming straight out of the front and back wall and then just angled down slightly. So if you like the securement of those pile mounts, the price certainly is very affordable. Uh, so I would have no real problem with that. The only thing I will mention, though, is the base where the pile mount connects to the wall is like wider than a stud, uh, but not wide enough to go across two studs. Right. So uh, I'm not super like, crazy about the base plate that goes against the wall side with that pile mount you kind of want to i don't know maybe install a flat piece of wood that spans two studs and then screw this base into that uh something along those lines uh, i certainly wouldn't want to rely on wall anchors when you have this much of a lever coming down even though the speaker might only be about 11 pounds if you extend that pile wall mount at all you got quite a lever going yeah. down there and i wouldn't want to rely on wall anchors just for that so uh it, it, all of that said i would be okay with that but if you just go over to uh mono price they just have i mean the thing is if you were looking up speaker wall mounts that's the wrong place to look you want to look for small tv mounts because that's where you're going to find the visa mounts so um over at mono price they just have one uh fully articulating so this can extend from the wall uh whatever distance you need and then it can tilt it can swivel it can rotate even <laughs> if you want to do that um 20 a piece so a little bit more expensive to get the pair but not drastically so however with that particular model that's only $20 a piece, the tilting angle maximum is plus or minus 20 degrees. So if you have this mounted right up high and you wanted something closer to a 30 or 45 degree tilt downward, so that's really aiming down at you, uh, the $20 each one just doesn't have that ability. So Monoprice has a little bit more expensive one, $31.50 uh, each. So I mean, still relatively affordable. Yeah. This one lets you tilt it uh, as much as 45 degrees up, which you would never use, but as much as 90 degrees down. <laughs> so, I mean, it can point straight down. Now, this is not like completely locking like the pile one. This is friction, but it is a full screw. It's not like a plastic disc or something like that, like a lot of them are. This is a, a full metal screw that goes in at your tilting angle. Plus, it lets you swivel or rotate or extend from the walls. So, something like that, if you want more adjustment capability, a little bit more money. I mean, basically, the cost for one of these is about the same price as the pair of the pile. Uh, but um, any of those could basically do what you need. So, those are some options. So, that being said, and I agree with everything Rob said as far as all this tilting. First of all, I think it's going to look goofy with these things like extended from the wall and <laughs> tilt it down or whatever. But you can also uh, sneak, sneak them back against the wall. So there's only a three inch gap between the, the back of the speaker and, right. the, and the wall. So um, either way. I, I don't really see that sonically you're going to find a huge difference between just flush mounting them to the wall with the, okay. the speaker mounts that you're talking about. And not flush mounting, you know, having mm. some sort of tilt to them. I, I feel like you're gonna go, go directly towards the Reddit. Point every speaker at my face. There's that thing, and I feel like that's the wrong direction to go. These are meant to be diffuse or more diffuse. Mm -hmm. You're already mounting them up in what arguably would be called for a 7.2.4 configuration. That's right. Uh, a little bit non-optimal as far as, you know, you, we'd rather have them Slightly on the ceiling and a sure. little bit slighter, more forward. So just getting the, the, the mounts, the flush mounts, mounting them above or slightly outside of your main speakers and on the front and the back wall, mm -hmm. I think it'd probably be fine. I might suggest turning them upside down if you did that, sure. just to keep Tweeters the tweeter closer. to the, to the bottom, I think no matter what you what mount you use, I would mount mm -hmm. them upside down. Now, okay. if that's going to drive you nuts, I would just put, put the, the grills grill, on. Grill there are magnetic on. grills on the Arendelle speaker, so you can put them upside down so the logo is still the correct way up. Yeah, um, uh, but uh, I mean, I think that you're <laughs> way overthinking this. The uh, only other it, thing I would say is I'm not sure how long ago he got the four Arendelle book sealed bookshelf speakers because Arendelle in that lineup has a wedge-shaped speaker that just mounts on the wall and has a built-in angle to it, just like SVS's Prime Elevations. So that's part of that 1961 series. They have a wedge-shaped speaker meant to work as height speakers so if it turns out that you actually just got those four bookshelf arendelle speakers not that long ago return them and swap them for the wedge-shaped ones and use those instead and then all your problems are easily solved and you don't need any additional mounts there you go 
Uh, on a different topic, he's got some fancy audiophile headphones. That's his words, not ours. <laughs> the ZMF Verite closed back headphones along with ZMF Pendant SC tube amp to power them. Sounds fancy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, he has used them at three different home and work locations prior to moving to his new house. They've always been sensitive to radio frequency interference because they're audiophile. So, you know. <laughs> Why would we? It's why would we build in any shielding? I mean, yes, right. it, the problem is you're, you should be in a Faraday cage. I mean, why are you listening to them in the open room, you neophyte? Uh, anyways, uh, sensitive to radio frequency interference, such as starting to buzz and click if a cell phone is placed too close. I used to have speakers like that. Yep, for like 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 uh, for my computer at, in my office. Was it like yeah. the world? You could always tell speakers. when a text or a call was coming before it rang or buzzed yes. on your phone because you yes. get the weird electricity clicking in your yeah. in your sound. <laughs> But as long as he was careful to keep any sources of interference far enough away, that always worked fine before. But now in this new house, they buzz all the time. He has some other headphone amps, and when he uses those, everything sounds fine. It just seems to be the pendant SC tube amp that always buzzes. He tried different rooms, different wall outlets, different cables. He switched out the tubes. He also tried plugging uh, the amp into the uh, Emotiva CMX2 power strip, which previously helps remove a buzzing sound from his Monoprice 5X amplifier that curiously doesn't buzz at all in this new house. But nothing worked. The ZMF F1 amp continues to buzz no matter what in his in this house. So any ideas? Yeah, that amp has got poor shielding on the inside. It has nothing to do with everything that's connected to it. There's something inside that amp that is acting as an antenna. Yeah, I mean, you move to a all new... The, 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 I mean, it could just be that you're... You know, that this particular house, yep. wherever you, it is, is getting a certain level of interference that is that nothing else in your house is sensitive, sensitive to, like, but it is across the entire house. Yeah, your you your know. new house, maybe there's a cell phone tower quite close to your house, yeah. and or it's power as lines, as that. power lines, power within lines, a certain certain or distance, yeah, a radio broadcast tower, or a TV broadcast tower, like anything that is sending out a bunch of RF constantly. Yeah. Your yeah. old house and your old work, wherever you were. They weren't as close. You didn't have this problem all the time, but you noticed that if you brought your cell phone close, it was picking that up. Maybe the new house is just near some kind of transmission tower or something like that, and it's as simple as that. You're just bathed in it. You, no. as a human, obviously never notice, but if a, you have a device like this that's very sensitive to radio frequency interference, it turns out it's telling you, yep, you're living in a location where you, you got a bunch of interference. So I don't know. Um, I think that's the most likely thing. I, <laughs> I there, really do. I don't do. really think that you can do anything about it. Nope. There's an an, your 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 amplifier has an antenna in it that is yeah. because of no offense poor audiophile design. And I don't mean that in like I said no offense to you or to them really. Um they are building things based you know trying to attract a certain type of consumer and you know they will often like we aren't using anything other than this and that is part of the features and that's why everybody mm -hmm. likes our products and everything else and people take it home and it's fine but then somebody like you gets it and looks like hey it's an antenna why is it you know what can i do and they're like oh well i mean look good news is you have other headphone amplifiers and they yeah. don't buzz and and guess what sounds better to any audiophile than <laughs> And an audiophile tube amplifier that buzzes is a non-audiophile non-tube amplifier that doesn't buzz. That's right. I will take that every day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so sell it. I mean, I'm, it, one yeah. of the uh, up, you know the nice things about audiophile gear is that there's always another audiophile out there that wants to try it. That's so, right. So, um, you know, I just would say, I, I would not say anything about it buzzing if I was selling it because... Chances are oh. no somebody else is not going to have the problem. Like just say, hey, I'm upgrading, which is true. That's right. Ty Ty has an Epson 5040 UB projector. While the native resolution of the panel is 1080p, it can wobble those panels twice per frame to and accept a 4K video signal. Mm -hmm. He uses a 30 foot fiber optic 18 gigabits per second HDMI cable to connect the Epson to his Onkyo TXNR6050 receiver. His main source is Xbox Series X. By default, the Xbox is able to send 4K and HDR10 through his Onkyo to his Epson. No problem. But for some reason, just with Disney+, Plus, it doesn't work. <laughs> it seems to be a theme this week. <laughs> it's one thing. One service. When the app, when the cylinder version comes out, it's going to work. Ah, it's gonna, yeah, that. That's the, it's going to fix the, the whole thing. It's that's just the ticket. you point the cylinder directly at the projector and it'll be fine. 
Uh, Disney Plus will only send 1080p, which also means no HDR, no Atmos. Netflix is fine. Games are fine. It's just Disney Plus. Is that just because Zepson can't do Dolby Vision? Does Disney Plus also require Dolby Vision support to, to send 4K and Atmos? Definitely the, not. If, if that were true, then no Samsungs would be able yeah. to play 4K Atmos because they don't do Dolby Vision. It, it, it is not to do with Dolby Vision. That is not definitely not the issue. He asked, does he need to get an HD Fury? It seems like the HD Fury doctor. Is that what that is? Yeah, it's the Dr. HDMI. Oh, HDM Fury Dr. HDMI device would do the trick, but it costs $130. He found some other EDID management devices for about half that price. Would one of those work just as well in his case? I will tell you, I, for my reading, and this is unrelated to this question because I don't know the okay. answer to this question, but from my reading of people who have gotten HDMI split and like, uh, audio extractors and stuff uh -huh. everybody says hey the hd fury stuff works like right but it's expensive but it works yeah. yeah and it's like other people are like yeah but i got this thing on amazon and it works just fine for me and then somebody else will be like i got that and it was crap because this is all the stuff <laughs> it did and the other person will say well i didn't notice any of that and then, which means they have no idea what that other person just said. <laughs> like they got audio and they stopped paying attention at that point. Right. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I Go ahead. so, I I don't know why specifically Disney, <laughs> Disney Plus, Plus is not working in this case because look, I I have managed to play 4K and HDR on an Xbox Series X from Disney Plus, so it's not like inherent to that app or something like that or inherent to the Xbox Series X. Could it be something to do with not getting the correct EDID from the Epson going through the fiber optic cable through an Onkyo before it gets the Xbox. I mean, absolutely. Seems unlikely. I mean, if everything's it working could. for everything else. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's just it. I mean, the Xbox apparently is like, yep, you're connected to a 4K HDR10 display. The other things work. I'm not sure why this is going wrong with Disney Plus specifically. There isn't really anything that could be in the web or mobile app because Disney Plus is. 4K HDR Atmos all the time. They don't have different tiers or yeah. things like that for you to go through. So honestly, my thought on this is you didn't want to pay $130. You were willing to pay $65 or $70. Just get an Amazon Fire or, mm. or some other streaming device. Get a Roku. <laughs> you know, Maybe that's not quite enough money to get an Apple TV 4K. I mean, get an Apple TV 4K if you're willing to spend about $100. But like, I would just take whatever money you were possibly thinking on spending on an HD Fury or some other EDID management device. Forget that. Just get a streaming stick. <laughs> that's what I would do. Mm. Because you know what? The streaming stick uses a whole lot less electricity when you're streaming video than the Xbox Series X does. Um, and... Like just the issues with the audio that the Xbox Series X still has, and that like you've got uh, an Onkyo NR6050 receiver, you've got additional HDMI ports. That's not the issue. So I would I would absolutely take fifty bucks and go get a Roku or an Amazon Fire TV and solve this that way. Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I am moving like mentally. I am starting to move my way away from the Xbox and get ready to start using the Roku yeah. that Ultra that I have uh, because I'm not really watching Twitch anymore. And the kids don't really watch it anymore. It's kind of yeah gone gone away from our n normal viewing habits. And the Roku is just better. There you <laughs> it go. Just works better. Yeah. Michael. Michael has two rows of seats in this theater. But until recently, he's only had a single pair of surround speakers, a pair of SVS Ultra bookshelves. That seems overkill for surrounds, but okay. <laughs> During SVS's labor sale, he picked up a pair of prime bookshelf speakers. He'd like to use those as a second pair of surround speakers for his back row of seats. At the moment, moment all of his speakers are powered by his Denon X6700H receiver. He doesn't have any external amps. So what will happen if he wires both the SVS Ultra and SVS prime bookshelf speakers to the same amplifier? Any problems since they aren't identical speakers? I mean, they could very well be different volumes. <laughs> they could play at slightly different volume levels. Yes, yeah, that that would be... Uh, in fact, we would expect them to because <laughs> they don't have exactly the same uh, efficiency. Sensitivity. The efficiency, exact same yeah. sensitivity. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm going to save what I think is the slightly off kilter but effective solution because he asked specifically about that so i'm going to save that just for a moment until we get to that question i know what um, it is i know yep. what you're going to say and <laughs> yep. it's it's it there's no way that the little bit of ocd i have in my life my personal ment my personal psychology would allow what you're I going know. to say 
to happen it, in my it would in totally my world. work and totally sound it fine would, it would sound fine and it would work but yeah. you are a you are a maniac for suggesting it and i do not approve <laughs> it's a good tease can we please review what happens if you wire says two pairs of surround speakers in parallel versus series? So one would uh, would uh, basically make your 8-ohm speakers become 16-ohm speakers, and the other way would make your 8-ohm speakers become 4-ohm speakers. <laughs> so, yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah in a that's, nutshell. One that, causes that's what goes on them there. to be harder to drive. One causes them to be very easy to drive. So Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what we would suggest doing is wiring them in series. Uh, it, it, I mean, you're, you're pretty much never going to run into a problem wiring them in series you might run into a problem if you wire them in parallel. And just to review, wiring them in parallel would be you have one set of binding posts, your surround binding posts on your AV receiver. You would have two pairs of speaker wires connected to those binding posts. And you would send one pair of speaker wires to surround speaker one, and you would send the other pair of speaker wires to surround speaker two. So you've got parallel paths one set of binding posts on the AV receiver, parallel paths to your two speakers, and that's going to cut your the impedance of those speakers. I mean, there, there's a calculation for exactly what it would be when the speakers aren't identical, yeah. but if they yeah, were identical, you would you would cut the impedance in half. And the, even though these are prime versus ultra bookshelf speakers, it's close enough that you're more or less cutting the impedance in half if you do it that way. That means the amplifier is now required to supply more current, which is more mm. difficult for it to do. So the safer and easier uh, thing to do is to wire them in series. Now, series, you could just think of, you've got the black speaker wire that's coming out of the surround binding post on your receiver. That's going to go into the black binding post of speaker one. Then you're just following this in a series path, one long loop. So now the red binding post of speaker one, that's actually going to connect to the black binding post of speaker two. We're just going in a line here. And then the red binding post of speaker two now goes back to the red binding post of the AV receiver. We've just made one loop that goes through both speakers. If you're just following a line that came out of one receiver's binding post and went to the other. Now, that doesn't mean you have to actually physically have the wire on your wall draped going from yeah. the red binding post of speaker one to the black binding post of speaker two. You can have two pairs of speaker wires that both come back to the AV receiver, just like if we did this parallel, but instead of connecting both of those pairs of speaker wires to the binding posts, we're just going to connect the black to speaker one, the red to speaker two, and then the leftover ones, they just connect to each other with a butt splice to make it all nice and safe. And now we've created the loop that way. So that's the easier way to wire it. You're still home running all the speaker wires, but we're actually going to just connect two ends of the loose speaker wires to each other and create the series circuit that way. So we would recommend wiring them in series. That being said, the fact that they're both surround speakers and they're probably right next to your couches, it almost certainly doesn't matter <laughs> you're just you'd you're, probably you're, you'd be probably. safe with parallel but yeah, yeah we, i mean given that physically it really makes virtually no difference at yeah. all we would just wire them in series yes lastly he said what's the best way to handle using two slightly different pairs of surround speakers for your two rows of seats <laughs> yeah and this Tom's is where solution. this is <laughs> this i mean the solution he's going to recommend uh -huh. absolutely will work yes it just never turn the lights on your home theater and you'll be fine. That's right. Because <laughs> never, what I would never suggest, look to your sides. What I would suggest fine. you do is you take your pair of SVS Ultra Bookshelf speakers and you put both of them on the left wall. <laughs> and then you take your pair of SVS Prime Bookshelf speakers and you put both of them on the right wall. Now you have identical speakers on the left and you have identical speakers on the right, and identical your, to your each AB other. Your AV receiver will have no problem level matching the That's two right. speakers that are on one side and they'll both be playing at the same volume. And you got the same sensitivity on, right on your left. Yep. You got the same sensitivity on the right. Now the left sensitivity array is a different sensitivity than the <laughs> array on the right, but that's okay. You can have different trim levels in your AV receiver for your surround left channel versus your surround right channel. The point is the two speakers on the left are playing at the same volume. The two speakers on the right are playing at the same volume, and that's the way to solve it. The other way to solve this would be to use... Uh, the pre-outs on your X6700H and connect them to external amplifiers that have their own gain or volume right. knob on the external amp, and then you could match the volumes between the two different pairs that way. That is definitely more money than just putting both ultras on the left and both primes on the right, but if you are OCD about the looks and you're like, I have to have the pair of ultras 
on the left and right for the front row and the pair of primes on the left and right for the back row, well, then you're going to want to get an external amplifier with its own volume adjustment so you can match the volume that way. Yeah. You maniac. <laughs> That's right. And look, that can be one of those Fosse amplifiers because those yeah. have their own volume knob. So it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. You can absolutely do it. I actually have a... I, I, I'll find that article in a second. But I have an uh, <laughs> article that has a bunch of amplifier re recommendations, including those with, uh, sure. with volume controls. And I'm sure yeah. that Fosse is on there. Jared. Jared asks, is it better to maintain a more ideal angle between your front left and right speakers and, ha then, and have that result... And the speakers being close to the sidewalls, or is it better to give more distance to the sidewalls but have the angle between the front left and right speakers be narrower, narrower than Dolby suggests as a result? <laughs> ah, that was fun to say. His <laughs> framing is done in Jared's new home theater build. He'll be installing sound clips and hand channels with two layers of drywall with green glue. When all of a sudden it's done, the width of the room will be exactly 11 feet. The length will be 21 feet. I guess ish, since the other one was exact. <laughs> he already owns a 109-inch Seymour AV Center Stage XD acoustically transparent screen. He already he has already used in his previous setup, sitting just nine and a half feet away. Even though it's not the UF ultra fine screen material, he will vouch for the XD material being totally fine from that short of a viewing distance with no visible weave or texture on the screen. So he plans to use the same seating distance in this new room with the frame included. The width is 101.5 inches. So if he places his ELAC debut 2.0 front book front uh, bookshelf front speakers on either side of the screen, there's only 15 inches to work with between the sides of the screen frame and the side walls. That mm -hmm. said, he'd have enough space to put four inch panels on the side walls directly beside the speakers to, to deal with the boundary effects and it would give him about a 52 degree spread from his front left and right speakers which is well within Dolby's guidelines if he puts mm -hmm. the front left and right speakers behind the screen along with the center they'll have just about uh, just under a 40 degree spread which is narrower than Dolby's guidelines so what do we say is the best approach in this case um and I see where he's coming from. We've, yeah, we've all seen too. the advice. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do too. So the idea here is if you do not, so he's if he puts them behind the screen, he has to work within the, the, the acoustically transparent material part That's of the right. screen. And within uh, the frame of the, of the yes. screen. Yeah. So he he has to deal with that. So that puts him a little bit closer together. So he's got mm -hmm. his you know his 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 left and right speakers kind of close to a center channel. So you don't get that separation. That's now, right. fifteen inches from a sidewall, I do not think is too close. I think it is close. Nor do I. I think mm -hmm. it is not too close. When I think of close, I'm thinking I can't squeeze my body right by the speaker. And between the speaker well, and the wall. Well, I mean, 15 inches from the side wall to the frame. So once you put a speaker there that's about seven and a half or eight inches wide, you're not going to fit your body between the side wall and the speaker yeah, anymore. Yeah, but you're going to be but, you're going to be proud of the, the you're going to be in front of the 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 the, uh, the screen itself anyway. So it's yeah. not going to be like you can still your sight lines will not be affected, and you can no. still cheat them in and a little bit. And you've still got enough space with 15 inches on either side of the screen frame that you can put a fairly thick acoustic panel there yeah. to deal with the boundary effects, just yeah. like you said. So like sometimes if you're like, look, I'm going to have seven and a half inches from the side wall to the side of my screen frame. I can just shove my bookshelf speakers in there, but there'd be absolutely no room for any treatments. I would not want to do that. But in your case, since it's 15 inches and there's enough room, you can put acoustic panels there. Some nice thick ones. Put some nice thick ones. You can put five and a half inch thick panels there. That's not a problem. Um, you know, I, I would I would personally do that because when, like, this is getting, you know, persnickety, but hey, you're building yourself a soundproof dedicated theater. You're, you're willing to get persnickety, I would say. Um, you know, sometimes the way sounds are mixed is that when a sound hard pans to say just the front left speaker, that yeah. is supposed to be slightly off screen. It is not supposed to be literally the visible edge of yeah. the left side of the screen. It's supposed to be slightly off screen. So my preference is to have my front left and right speakers just to the outside edges of my screen. And you can absolutely do that as long as you treat exactly like you've suggested doing. That's what I would do. Yes, I completely agree. I think that... Okay. Uh, I would be on the outside. I don't think this is too close. Honestly, if you're like, I have to put them on the wall, 
be like, nah, okay, put them on the wall. Mm. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> you know, well, I, I mean, like, like I said, if you were in that scenario where like I've only got six inches to either side of my screen frame, then I'd be like, okay, put them on the inside. Yeah. That, that would be my suggestion. And then you can still put some acoustic treatments on your side walls and you could put you the still speakers to, just... Yes. Yeah, just to the inside edges, but with 15 inches, you got enough. You can put them just to the outside edges and still have the acoustic treatments on the sidewalls. That's what yeah. I would do. I agree. I think that, this, like Rob said, having the, the sound actually physically leave the side of the screen, yeah. I yeah. think, it doesn't happen all that often, but it happens a lot more than you think. And like, just you like I was talking does, about... Well, go ahead. What does it quite a bit is the Simpsons. The Simpsons yeah. do that effect quite often. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, that's the way I would go. Mike. Mike says, and this will be our last question, I think, probably. Oh, we'll I would love to get Rohan's because he really needs our help. And All Mike's right. very short. I think we can do it. We'll see. If yeah. you still have a Harmony remote and you're buying one of the newest, t newest TVs or AV receiver models, is Logitech still adding new model numbers to the Harmony database? Or are you forced to just program everything using a previous model number and, or resorting to use, using the learn IR commands function? So on AV Gadget, it's, um, uh, Andrew went through and basically bought a new, new to him, uh, right. you know, used Logitech <laughs> remote and set it up someplace. Yeah, from scratch, yeah. From scratch. And just to see if it could be done because we're like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And people are, you know, like I've read online, people are like, oh, you have to use the app, the mobile app because the, the whatever. He downloaded the, the program. He was able to the desktop down, software, the, 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 the desktop so, uh, software, which you do need from time to time. Because I had mm. to reprogram my parents' remote the other day, and uh, I needed the desktop software to do it. And he was able to do all that stuff, mm. and he did not complain at all about you know, the fact that there were some things not supported. But I don't know how new the gear was, so maybe Rob can address that in particular. Yeah. So I mean, at the moment, Logitech is still updating their code database. Um, that they are still adding new models to it. Like the, the newest Denon receivers are in there. Um, you know, some of the newest TVs are in there. So they are at the moment still updating that database. Uh, they are still issuing updates to the Harmony Remote app on your smartphone from time to time. So they haven't completely abandoned the backend support just yet. Now, the day will come eventually when they do. So, um, you know, at that point, hopefully we've got a full on replacement. And then, uh, you know, the workaround, I mean, there were always, always, even when when Harmony was in full flight, always some esoteric yeah. models out there or country specific models, which would sometimes occur uh, that, you know, they didn't have in their database. At that time, you could contact their support and get it added. That's not really happening so much anymore. So in those specific cases, you do need to look for a similar or a different country's model number. Like that happens with TCL TVs fairly often because they use different model numbers in like every different country they're in. And every single one of those model numbers doesn't show up in Harmony's database. But if you can find the similar model from a different country or very often just the previous model year, that does work perfectly fine because there isn't tremendous difference from year to year what a tv's remote buttons need to be uh so yeah at the end of it you can always fall back to the learn ir commands exactly like you said but for the moment i would still use a harmony they are still updating the database i know that uh, andrew said that that i think he he mentions in here when was the last time they updated it i think it was well that was the app specifically yeah, the app. which yeah. was like six months ago but i yeah. mean they are still issuing updates for that's it. that's good yeah. All right, let's do Rohan and we'll be done. Yeah, Rohan perfect. recently upgraded uh, his old Denon X2000 receiver to the new Marantz SR6015. He is starting to regret having done so as using the new setup is turning into a bit of a nightmare. Speaker-wise, he's just using 5.1 setup. Uh, he has an Ethernet cable plugged into the Marantz and he makes extensive use of Heos. The other sources plugged into the Marantz are his Panasonic UB420, Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and Amazon uh, Fire TV 4K Max. The problem he is having is that sometimes, for reasons he cannot figure out, it's CEC. <laughs> it, it, I, I, it is. You've guessed it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, literally, you read it. For reasons he cannot figure out, it's CEC. That is always the answer. My lord. <laughs> My suspicion is there's a specific part of CEC, but yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> mad right now. I am so mad. I did, I'm going to link an article uh, for Rohan so that he can commiserate yeah. with the fact that, I mean, I think I'm, I'm going to link a couple. I have one that's called, um, is, HG, is Home Theater Dead or What's Killing Home Theater mm -hmm. or something like that? And it 
It is HDMI CC. It is. That is what's <laughs> killing home theater because of this thing right here where people yeah. are like, they they get they 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 get to from from you know, I have a TV, I have a sound bar, I want the real I want to get real speakers, and then yeah. everything goes to crap because yes. HDMI CC yeah. starts to like act like a poltergeist in your house. That's right. And and Rohan is gonna very reasonably at this moment in the podcast go. I don't think it can be because, as we will see in a moment, he has turned HDMI CEC in his Marantz, or so, uh, yeah, Marantz. He has turned it off there. He, he sent uh, photo evidence that he has turned off <laughs> HDMI control in his Marantz. But to stick with us, Rohan, it, it's still HDMI CEC. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to, to. I didn't mean to spoil the answer here. But okay. Okay. The problem he's having is that sometimes, for reasons he cannot figure out, no audio comes out of any of his speakers. If he cycles the power on his source device or on the Marantz itself, that usually gets the audio working again. But it's very frustrating to not know what is causing causing this or how to properly fix it. And nobody on the internet seems to have any idea. I had an idea immediately. <laughs> Let's go. Help him. We're his only hope. This no sound coming out problem mostly seems to happen when he goes to play music via Heos. Yep. But it has some. some it has happened the odd time with his Panasonic and his Amazon Fire TV as well. Is it just a hardware issue? He doubts it. He sent oodles of photos of all of the Maranza settings, so he's hoping we have an idea how to fix this. What do we say? And he, I, I curated the list of, I think it was 42 photos that he oh said to God. just the pertinent ones uh, to, to comment on. I know this is very small for Tom to see, uh, and it's kind of small for myself as well, but I mean, I just wanted to you know go through some of these uh that he had there so i mean just on your basic speaker setup i've got that there um you know th that's fine you've assigned the amplifiers correctly you've set the crossovers correctly yeah, uh you know i just small, wanted to reassure him to set the small it's got yep. one subwoofer that's right he uh, set a, 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 a global 80 hertz crossover for all of those subwoofer set to lfe mode didn't touch the low pass for, uh, for lfe so that's right, all fine that's good the Network control, because he's specifically talking about Heos. So um, I'm not exactly, he, he's left that off in standby, the network control. Uh, just from a Heos point of view, I might want to turn that on so that you can activate your AV receiver from your mobile device when it's in standby. So that's just one thing, although that that doesn't have anything to do with the speakers not playing. Um, and then we're seeing, like, I don't know what display he connected this to, but it is uh, VRR capable, 48 gigabit per second capable, uh, 4K 120 capable. Capable, so a pretty up-to-date display. So this isn't some uh -oh. case where you know the display <laughs> is old or something like that. I do see some HDMI pass-through that's turned on though. Oh so. yes, here we go. Here <laughs> we go. Yeah. So um so yeah, so we so this is one of the things he's got. If an you want to follow pass. along with these pictures, we got our that's Flickr right. album, or that's you can right. go to the YouTube video. Yeah, so he's got an HDMI pass-through that is set to on. Now the uh, purpose of this is when you put your AV receiver into standby mode, so now you aren't using your surround sound speakers. You can still use a source with the TV's built-in speakers. That is what the HDMI pass-through is all about. Now, he has that on, and he has the pass-through source fixed to his Amazon Fire TV streaming device. I don't know how much you use that, but what that does when you have that HDMI pass-through functionality set to on is... We see on the very same screen that he has set HDMI control, that is Marantz's name for HDMI CEC, he's turned that off. He has also turned off the audio return channel. He's apparently not making use of the apps that are built into his TV. He's turned those things off. But with HDMI pass-through on, that means nothing. It means yeah. absolutely nothing that you have really? set those to off. They're still on. They're on <laughs> because you, you have HDMI pass through <laughs> on. There's nothing you can do about it. You did I, nothing I don't, wrong. I don't believe he's using it because it would mean that the, the the video was coming out of his projector. I mean, the audio was coming out of his projector, right? I mean, that's how that would work. Does he have a well, projector? No, it's, not, it's not a projector. It's a 4K 120 VRR oh, okay. display. Sorry, 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 sorry. So it's a I TV. So I mean, else. maybe sometimes he does just quickly check something on his Amazon Fire TV. He doesn't need the whole surround sound system to come on. So he's activated the pass through so that some sound comes out of the TV's built in speakers. But with that setting being on, it means that everything you said about HDMI control and audio return channel, forget it, ignore it. I know the settings are right there in front of your face. You manually turn them off because by default they're on. I know you did that, 
it doesn't matter. <laughs> They're still on as far as the Marantz is concerned. One other thing is the TV audio switching on this Vario same screen, even though that is related to the audio return channel and you've manually turned the audio return channel off, the TV audio switching is still set to the default of on. That is supposed to go off when you turn the audio return channel off, but you would need to manually activate audio return channel temporarily put that back to on then manually turn the tv audio switching off and then turn the audio return channel back off because again it just ignores everything when one of those things is left on and i suspect very strongly that your tv audio switching is the problem uh. the tv audio switching is the audio return channel it just takes control whenever it darn well feels like it and says hey I'm the source now. Pay attention to me, the TV audio switching. Don't pay a attention to any of the sources that you're actually using at this moment. Um, one way that you could potentially solve all of this in one fell swoop would be to actually switch your HDMI video output to monitor two only. Right now, mm -hmm. he's set it to monitor one, which is not even the default. The default is monitor one and monitor two mirrored. That's right. the default. He set it to monitor one only. Monitor one is the audio return channel port. You aren't using the audio return channel. You aren't using HDMI CEC. Like, you've manually turned those off. You apparently don't want to use those. You do want to use the HDMI pass-through. You can still do that on monitor two, but monitor two does not have the audio return channel on it. And you can manually set your HDMI video output to only come out of monitor two. So that would be the first thing I would suggest, because that is a single settings change. Because whenever we're talking about changing multiple settings, we won't necessarily know what caused this, but you could... In one settings change, set your HDMI video output to monitor two. You would, of course, have to physically move the HDMI plug from monitor one to monitor two on the back of your Marantz receiver, but that's the only physical change you would need. That might solve your issue. And if it does, then we know it was all of this audio return channel and TV audio switching nonsense. There is another thing I want to draw your attention to, though. He's gone through and he's like, he's only using two of the HDMI inputs on the back of his Marantz. So for convenience, instead of having to manually push a distinct input button on the Marantz remote, he could just put like the cycle through the inputs in order button. And since he only uses two of them, he's gone ahead and manually hidden all of the other HDMI and audio inputs. Those are hidden from the just cycle through inputs when I repeatedly press the input button. It should only be basically toggling between his Panasonic player and his Amazon right. Fire TV. If you hide the TV audio input, which is one of the options, and he's done it, and I don't know why it's an option, because if you hide that option, believe me, everything just goes to hell. <laughs> like, even if you're never using the TV audio input, the HDMI audio return channel input, even if you're never using, if you hide that input from the cycle through all my inputs thing, just expect everything to go to hell. I don't know why. I don't know why they give you the option to hide it when everything goes to hell, when you hide it, but it's there and you did it. And I would definitely recommend not hiding it because it, I don't know why it just completely causes issues, but it does. So those are the two things I would change. And if that fixes it, then hooray. All right, Rohan, I need you to, I don't, I, I just looked through my emails. I couldn't find his email with this, this, okay. this thing on here, but I would like access to all of these pictures and permission to use them on AV gadgets oh, okay. because I am often looking for menu pictures Yes, and I rarely have access to them. And I have to like go turn on my projector and everything else to go get the menu picture so that I can take a picture of it and put it on there. So, it, Rohan, so I can I can certainly forward you the email with all the images. If Rohan, you can just provide Tom permission to use yeah, them on. Just send AV me gadgets. an email at tomavgadgets.com that has uh, the permission to use. Uh, Fantastic. Those photos would be great. All right, who do we have left? Jim is last on the list there, and you will be first up next week. All right. Um, why does it say green? I don't know what's huh? going on, but okay. I don't know. I don't know either. All right. Let's thank our oh, listeners. Yeah, that, that was to remind us that 
<laughs> something, there was something to do with it. All I remember was green. I was supposed to remind you like after the podcast to tell me something. Oh, right, that. right, right, right. That's right. That's Good right. Good thing I, I put that note because yeah. I completely forgot about yes, it. Yes, it's going well. Um, <laughs> thank our listeners of the week. We thank for Ty for going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy a Cup of Coffee link and sending us a PayPal donation, a monthly PayPal donation. That's right. And our 133 patrons over at patreon.com, including Bertrand. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Ty, for your financial support via PayPal. In fact, automatic monthly. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that. And patreon.com slash podcast is the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation that way. The only option is automatic monthly over at Patreon. Uh, so thank you very much to our 133 patrons there. And Bertrand, thank you for continuing to be one of them. So thank those for sending us notes of gratitude from Ty, Daz, Jared, James, and Rohan. Thank you for thanking us. Yes, thank you, Ty, Daz, Jared, James, and Rohan. Thank you to everybody who also sent uh, well wishes to Tom and that through yes. like YouTube and X and wherever the heck yes. else. I didn't bother to look and gather those up. I, we we still appreciate those. I'm just too lazy to look anywhere other than email. <laughs> and uh, big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. To get your question answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.